Okay, I think live streaming is started. So, Pooja, you can start. A very good evening, one and all. I'm Dr. Pooja, senior scientist at CSIO Chandigarh and member in IAS. It's a pleasure for me to welcome on behalf of entire INYAS community to this annual general body meeting being held virtually. To kickstart today's session under GBM, I invite Dr. Chandrasekhar Sharma, Chair INYAS, to formally welcome all the delegates and participants, as well as put forward his opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Chandra. Thanks. Thanks, Pooja. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the year 2020 has been extraordinary and will be known in the history for changing our lives by the events that occurred around us. On a positive note, the importance of science and the scientists to the society has never been so acceptable before. This brings challenges as well as opportunities for the scientists, especially the young scientists. INYAS, as only recognized Academy of Indian Young Scientists, rose to the occasion as was necessary to communicate and promote science and helping in maintaining the trust in science and the scientists in these challenging times. As a chair, I really feel proud on INYAS to organize a large number of science outreach activities digitally at a time when we all were stranded due to this global pandemic. In 2020, INYAS has widened its horizons significantly, be it in the form of working together with the various organizations at the national level to have more impact on the ground or leading the international collaborations with other national young academies. Several new programs are initiated towards the capacity building and gender inclusiveness in the STEM through our local chapters and dissemination of scientific information in the local languages, INYAS is now able to reduce the gap between the common men and the science. We also made special efforts in our membership drive to reach out to the organizations where INYAS was not represented before in last six years since its inception. These efforts were reflected in receiving the record number of applications this year and 24 new young, bright, emerging scientists have been selected for the NIAS membership mm -hmm. from 15 new organizations and representing 30% women members. Today, we are inaugurating our sixth annual general body meeting, and I formally welcome all new members to it. This year's GBM is unique in many ways. Not only it's just online, it's a span over four days with five sessions, out of which there are two sessions open to all. There are two public lectures and a full technical symposium on infectious diseases. We also have an exclusive session with our alumni. Today, we are inaugurating this general body meeting now with this panel discussion on integration of science, state science and technology councils with the central science and technology organizations for wider impact, which will be followed by the first public lecture by Dr. Shekhar Mande at 7.30 p.m. today. With this, I request my colleague Gitanjali to go ahead with today's proceedings. Gitanjali, over to you. Thank you, Shekhar. And a very good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us at the INYA's sixth annual GBM panel on integration of science, state science and technology councils with the central science organizations. I'm your host, Gitanjali Yadav, and I've been a member of INYAS since 2016. I hold a joint appointment at the India-Cambridge Interface, and I have been a scientist for the last 16 years with interest in food security and conservation. Today's format, or today's panel, this comprehensive panel that we are, going, we are all part of, the format is that I'm going to provide a short background of the topic of the panel, which is integration between science and uh, states, highlighting the issues of connectivity and cooperation at the interface of these two, the state councils and the central government agencies of science, especially with involvement of INYAS. This will be followed by an introduction of all the panelists, and then we will, I will request them to say a few words about the current roles, their current roles in the state or in the center or both. Once the initial introductions are done, maybe two minutes each panelist, I will then raise a few questions about the theme of today's panel, which will then be addressed in detail by interaction with the panelists during the rest of the session. Some of the questions that we will address to the panelists will be common, 
to all panelists, uh, while others will be addressed specifically to specific panelists. Uh, we specially invite and welcome our uh, questions from our audience and ask you to type these out in the chat box, please. Your questions will be taken at the end, uh, keeping time constraints in mind indeed. Uh, so each panelist will have time at the end for presenting final comments, and I will then be summing up the session for today. So as you can see on the screen, the theme of today's panel is not just critical for the science community in India, but also globally as India increasingly gains importance on the world map in terms of science and technology. In his address at the 106th Indian Science Congress on the 3rd of January 2019, the Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi had emphasized the need for establishing an expanded research ecosystem in India. He had said that our strengths in research and development are built on the backbone of our national laboratories, the central universities, the IITs, the Indian Institute of Science, the TIFA, and the ICERS. However, over 95% of Indian students still go to state universities and colleges to study, where research is still hugely limited and meagerly funded. So therefore, a strong research system and an ecosystem must be developed in these universities and colleges. This is not a new thought. In fact, to give you a background, the initiative to establish state councils for science and technology was first taken by Bharat Ratna, late Sri Subramaniam in 1971, because it was felt since then that unless and until states are integrated with the center, true development of the nation cannot take place. We are striving even today, but I think now in 2021, as we will be talking uh, through this panel, there is something new. There's a lot of new stuff, new things that are happening on this um, uh, arena with the National Research Foundation and the science and technology policy, the STI policy and so on. So um, going back to the 1970s, Sri Subramaniam, he was then the Minister of Science and Technology and he wrote to each chief minister in India at that time for all the states, stressing that irrespective of the large investments of the central government in science and techno technology and uh, you know, in various sectors, institutional infrastructure and so on, the central agencies must take the states along if the developmental goals are to be attained. So by the end of the fifth five-year plan, we had the Karnataka uh, Science uh, and Technology Council, we had the Kerala State Council, the Uttar Pradesh uh, State s &T Council, as well as the Bengal, West Bengal Council. So four states had it who had established this. And as on date, India has 28 state science and technology councils and also three union territory councils. So several states, what they have done is that they have formed a separate department of science and technology um, as we have a representative from the, uh, the uh, Department of Science and Technology, Rajasthan today, who will be talking to us about this later. Uh, and the state councils, what they usually do is that they normally are chaired by the chief ministers themselves of those respective states or by an eminent scientist, or as in case of Rajasthan, by uh, an IS officer or bureaucrat. So in general, the funding for these state sci uh, science and technology councils, uh, basically it's coming from DST for the organizational structure where DST is funding the manpower in these uh, councils. Whereas for all the work that they are doing, this, the state government is funding them. So therefore it is a joint kind of funding. However, the main focus of the state councils has been till to date, outreach, support of students, technology dissemination, and in a few cases, some extent of research. Today at this panel, we have four panelists, one from the central agencies, one representing the state councils, and two who have played and continue to play pivotal roles in connecting the center and the state. I will now be introducing these panelists, and uh, after that, we will have their uh, introductory remarks. Our first panelist is a representative of the premier central science agency in India, the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. Dr. Arabinda Mitra was appointed as the scientific secretary of the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India in June 2018. Dr. Mitra started his own career way back in 1985 as a research scholar at the Department of Geology in Delhi University. In 1987, he joined the Department of Atomic Energy, Government of India as a scientific officer, and he was involved in survey and exploration geology of the Himalayas. In 1988, he was awarded the prestigious Cambridge Nehru Fellowships to pursue a PhD in Earth Science at the University of Cambridge. 
Uh, the project work that he carried out there was jointly with the MIT USA in REE uh, geochemistry of the mid ocean ridge hydrothermal systems. He also has spent several years heading the international division of the Department of Science and Technology Government of India, where he played a pivotal role in catalyzing the prestigious frontier of science meetings where young scientists are able to present cutting edge research to the rest of the young scientists in the world at, a, at an equal level. More recently, in his role as the scientific secretary at the office of the PSA, Dr. Mitra has been critically involved with the formulation of both the STI policy 2020, as well as the National Research Foundation, for which we will question him in a bit. Our second panelist is a representative of the states. She is Ms. Mogda Sinha, currently secretary to the government, art, literature, culture, and archeology, span science and technology, as well as being the Director General Jawahar Kala Kendra Rajasthan Jaipur. Ms. Linha is an officer of the Indian Administrative Service, Rajasthan Kader, and she started her, her career as an IS officer of the 1999 batch. She holds a diverse educational background with an MPhil in international policy, international diplomacy. Uh, she also has an MA in international relations, a BA with honors in history. It is a pleasure for me to introduce her to the INYAS today and the wider science community that is listening to us today as she has single-handedly transformed the Rajasthan State Science and Technology Council with her multiple women in science initiatives, as well as her direct approach of wishing to interact with and meeting with students at schools and colleges personally. I welcome you, madam, and I, uh, you know, I will be asking you to say a few words to us in a bit. Our third panelist, is Ajit Rangmaker, the director of the Hyderabad City Cluster and the Research and Innovation Circle of Hyderabad. He's the director of the first city cluster launched very recently in India. He's also the former dean of the Indian School of Business, ranked by the Financial Times as one of the world's leading business schools. Prior to being at the School of Business, he was director of the Graduate Management Admission Council, where he was the sole Indian on the team. And before his association with the ISB, Ajit was the country head for Price Waterhouse Consulting in Hong Kong and Philippines. He was head of the telecom and entertainment industry consulting practice for the PwC in East Asia, all the way from China to Indonesia. And his educational background is really interesting. He completed an undergraduate degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. So here we have somebody who's a scientist as well as a business leader, and he's got a postgraduate degree in management from the leading business school in India, the IIT, IIM Ahmedabad. I welcome you, Ajit and we'll ask you for a couple of comments very soon. Our last and final panelist for the evening is again, someone who works at the interface of the states and the nation, uh, the chairperson of Kenya's Dr. Chandrasekhar Sharma. He's currently the associate professor. He's currently an associate professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the IIT Hyderabad, and is also the chairperson, as I said, of the Indian National Young Academy of Science. As the chair of INYAS, Dr. Chandra has been instrumental in taking several new initiatives for capacity building and gender inclusiveness in STEM. Dr. Chandra has received several awards and recognitions at the national and international levels, including the recent honor of the prestigious DST Swarna Jayanti Fellowship in Engineering Sciences. He is also serving as the PSC member of various SERB and DST committees, including technology development programs, the waste management technologies, and so on. He has more than 100 international peer reviewed uh, publications to his uh, uh, credit and has guided uh, nine PhD students so far. I welcome you, Shekhar. And with that, I now give over the stage to our panelists to introduce themselves. First of all, a welcome to Dr. Mitra. Dr. Mitra, would you, uh, would you like to, would you, you know, just give us a few introductory remarks on today's panel and the theme of connecting state councils with national science agencies? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kitanjali. Uh, let me first begin by thanking Inyas for having me here. Of course, I'm no stranger to Inyas, <clears throat> having been very closely involved in many of your activities, but uh, it's really I'm very proud and privileged to be speaking to you today on a very, very important topic. So uh, let me just begin by saying, you know, what, what COVID taught us, you know. In one line, COVID taught us uh, what is called leveraging partnerships and collaborations. And this is the underlining theme which COVID taught us. 
At a time when the nation was challenged, we saw how right across the entire SNT ecosystem, from academia, laboratories, industries, startups, the government, and the people at large, all came together in a seamless manner to deliver some of the most challenging needs of the country of the tower. And as actually Chandra alluded to, the scientists and technologists played a very, very important role in this. Uh, and there has been a recognition of the fact that the last 70 years or more investments which the government has made in science and technology really paid off. And, uh, and this of course did happen, the realization did happen because of the simple underlining theme which I call as collaboration. In my long 30, 34 years of uh, you know, professional life, I think uh, most of the part of my life I have been involved in international collaboration. I think Gitanjali, Mr. Allude uh, to that, uh, working in the Antarctic expedition and then the Indo-US Science and Technology Forum and DST, where I really believed in leveraging the complementary strengths that we have across the entire ecosystem in the country. And I think today's topic really speaks about that and it cannot be more relevant than anything else. So the Office of PSA's work is what you said, the integration, which is the theme of today's discussion. How really across all the various streams in the country that we bring and converse them together so that collectively, you know, we can deliver in a more effective manner. So I think it's very, very important, a very, very relevant topic. Uh, uh, but, you know, I really want to allude to the fact that uh, the participation of the state governments uh, in this whole sphere of science, technology, research, development, and innovation has been very skewed. Uh, though, as you said, in 1971, this was envisioned, but, you know, uh, uh, somehow we find today that uh, this is very, very minimal, very skewed. The latest data from DST would tell you that out of the total expenditure that goes into R&D, the, the contribution of all the states put together is less than 8,000 crores, which accounts to only 6.5% of the national R&D expenditure, right? Which actually translates to 0.04% of the net GDP, right? This is really suboptimal. Today, for the first time, you would realize that government of India in its budget statement has very clearly said that one of the pillars of the growth of the country is research and innovation. And this whole mainstream, therefore, the states have to play a very, very major role. And as Gitanjali, you did allude to a while ago that more than 92% of our students go in state universities and colleges. And therefore, it is very important that the states look at science, technology, research, development, and innovation as a very integral part of or a pillar in their developmental roadmap. If, if you look at the state R&D budgets that I talked about, you know, there are several challenges that we see. First, the data that we have is all disjointed. Number one, we do not have even a correct way of capturing the data. Most of the investments which the states have done has been mostly in the agriculture sector. 80%, I would say, has been in the agriculture sector and rest 88%, in fact, and rest roughly 12%, a little less than 12% has been in education related to science and technology. So there is therefore a need for, the, for, for a more effective mechanism for the integration of the states into this endeavor of the scientific and technological enterprise. Uh, which is going to be the most important uh, pillar in this knowledge economy of the 21st century uh, if India has to become a soft prowess uh, in technology. So uh, this is very critical. You know, I would perhaps my, give my later comments later on. But very briefly, I must say that two quick things which uh, our Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor has been actively working on, which is very relevant to the states and the integration of the entire ecosystem, is we have at the apex body called the Prime Minister Science Technology Innovation Advisory Council, which meets regularly and looks at various issues that the country is facing, right from waste management to genomics to, you know, you name it, uh, geospatial technologies, everything across, and gives us a broad guideline as to where and what are the focus areas. And very recently, in fact, just before the COVID, uh, in fact, was the constitution of the Empowered Technology Group. And this Empowered Technology Group is chaired by the PSA and the office is in the Principal Scientific Advisors 
Office Excel. And one of the important mandates of the ETG is really technology infusion horizontally across the central government and the state government. So SNT in a, in a more larger viewpoint will not be only left or confined to the scientific and technological departments and ministries of government of India, which funds the major chunk of the SNT in the country, but use of technology across in all the ministries and departments of government of India is an important step or role that the ETG is now taking. And in that process, one of the mandate is to engage with the states also, to look at the technological needs of the state and empower them as well by connecting them with the ecosystem. So these are two very major initiatives. And of course, the city clusters with Ajit can speak of, uh, you know, how we are integrating the states with the, uh, with, with the efforts of the center. So I think I'll stop here to begin with, and then perhaps, you know, allude to your questions more as we go down the discussions. Uh, so over to you, Gitanjit. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. It's, it's really good to have your views at the outset because in the last two weeks since we announced this panel, I've been interviewing different people from different state science and technology councils as well as in the DST. And I realized that the DST, as you said just now, is planning to go into an administrative mode with all the state councils and they're going to be involving them much more in core science and technology. So more on that by and by. May I now request uh, you, Ms. Ms. Meghdas Mugdasena, to please give us a few introductory remarks on your views on the theme of today's panel, the integration between state councils and the center. Ms. Inha. Yeah, thank you very much, Gitanjali and Inyas for giving me this opportunity of being present uh, in this August uh, gathering of uh, primarily scientists. And I find myself to be uh, the odd one out being a science administrator uh, and not a scientist, as you, as you know. But thank you very much for making me acceptable uh, in this community. And very, very happily acceptable because I want to at the very outset mention that our government of Rajasthan, uh, you know, of course, uh, COVID was a, a great turning point in terms of acceptability of science and research and technology and innovation, not just in the general public or in the scientific community, but also in the government's own thought processes, which has actually enabled a whole lot of designing or redesigning in the um, you know, government scheme of thought process of how they would want to administer such um, uh, technical departments, right? So that is one thing which has happened. Against this background, I find that when I joined this department in July 2019, which is almost a year and a half, uh, I was also, I'm also now the Secretary of Art and Science, uh, Art and, um, uh, you know, Literature and Culture. So this is a very, very happy amalgam because in many ways, if you look at neuroscience, it is actually getting both the right and the left side of the brain uh, to work together. The cognitive faculties and also your emotive faculties coming together, the logical and the rational side coming together and the creative. And this is exactly what science is all about. Science is basically about a multidisciplinary approach. Because what is science doing? Science, in my understanding, and this is how I've been able to administer the department, you know, being a scientist is one thing and being able to administer science for the scientists, which basically means being able to provide a policy architecture uh, where the science, what the scientists do uh, in the silos of the labs becomes available to the society at large because the aim of each one of us today in whatever capacity that we are, uh, we might be uh, deans of schools like we have Ajit sir. We, would, uh, we could also be policy makers like I just heard uh, Dr. Mitra. We could be chairpersons of uh, INYAS like we have uh, Chandrasekhar ji or we could be bureaucrats. We could be scientists per se. We could be common people. But the idea is to be able to solve the problem of society. And this is exactly uh, one thing which brings all of us together here on this common uh, forum and which is what makes all our research uh, translational in nature to be able to reach out and solve the problems. And the problem that we were solving in the last one year, of course, was COVID. And we were doing it through different instruments available to us. Uh, you know, I have always found great inspiration in what Archimedes has said in terms of the lever. You know, you give me the lever long enough and I will be and the fulcrum of the right size and I'll be able to move the earth. So science, research, technology provides that kind of a creative stimulus to be able to solve all that problem. 
And I would absolutely agree with what Dr. Mitra has said that, you know, if we have to spur our manufacturing, it has to move from industrial manufacturing to a more science and research technology and innovation based manufacturing, if at all, we have to make our country self reliant. So that is how, uh, and you know, stakeholders become very, very important uh, in this and the stakeholders are on one side, uh, 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 the scientists on the other, that is the academia, basically the research academia, the industry, you know, we also have this policy called the industry academia collaboration, which is very, very important. If we have to provide hands on experience uh, of the industry in the academia, because that is how we will be able to benefit society at large. So I see my role as a connector of dots, you know, connectors of stakeholders, connectors of issues, bringing a multidisciplinary approach, uh, making science translational, bringing science communication. In the last one and a half years, uh, part, most of it during the COVID, we have done series of YASH dialogues from different platforms and creating awareness about science becomes very, very important. So what I have probably been able to do in my own uh, uh, tenure in, in DST, in the council and in the department is to uh, you know, uh, raise awareness about what are the opportunities available, extending those opportunities in terms of expertise, in terms of funding, in terms of resources to our stakeholders, uh, bringing the stakeholders in connection, uh, uh, you know, their institutes, bringing them in touch with institution, other institutions, the scientific, uh, uh, you know, the CSI are led research organizations. So getting these institutional linkages, right, developing those institutional linkages. I am totally against the personality based kind of a, a initiative. So we are trying to institutionalize a whole lot of these stuff by uh, making small schemes or making policies so that uh, uh, whatever we have been able to do in the small time will last uh, 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 a longer time. And I am totally a, uh, in sync with this whole idea of a state and a center connect because the state can give us, the center can give us a vision uh, and also funding will flow according, that, according to that vision. The state also has a vision. My role is to connect the vision of the center, the vision of the state, and take it down to the cutting edge level of the subdivisions, the rural areas, the rural innovators, the women mapping the needs of the district. So that is what I'm doing. And I think we can take up more when Gitanjali asks me questions. So thank you very much and very, very happy to be a part of this and look forward to learning more from everybody who's present here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Sinha. I, I see Ajit clapping. I mean, I cannot tell you how, how fantastic it is to listen to you, especially the idea of you began with art and science. You know, for 10 years, I myself have been, I was, a, I should say, a lab rat, four walls of my office, just doing my research, my own little bits. And in the last four years, the amount of work that I've seen and done at the interdisciplinary level, including outreach, we very recently, you're very well aware with your initiatives, we have done a women in AI uh, event with Inyas. And in fact, for our listeners, I would like to say that the Department of Science and Technology, Rajasthan, is the first state s &T council who got in touch with actively with the Inyas. And we did many things together during the pandemic to, to help the students and and uh, college youth who were stuck inside their houses, locked down, unable to do research. And together with her initiatives and the DST Rajasthan, Inyas has, able to, has been able to take leading steps. So I'm so glad to hear your views. I'm so, I, I, I should be clapping just the way Ajit was here. This is fantastic. And we hope, we hope very much that you're going to stay connected with us and we can set an example for the other state science and technology councils also. I will be, ragging you a bit later on on uh, on the issue of scientists and bureaucrats and how they see but you've actually you've actually stumped me already with your answers but still i'm going to ask you a couple of questions when we come to that for now may i may i move on to our uh, third panelist a uh, panelist uh, of the evening uh, may i request mr ajit rangnekar to please say a few words or introductory remarks about what you think about the the theme of today's panel of integrating youth young scientists uh, and the state councils with the central agencies. Ajit. Thank you, thank you, Gitanjali. And uh, thank you, Indias. And uh, I'm glad to see that one of my fellow Hyderabadis is the chair of Indias. So 
you know, we we at the state uh, feel very proud of our state. As you know, you know, we are the youngest state in the country. But before I start on my state, let me just take a 30 second diversion. Miss Sina, phenomenal. That was seriously wonderful. If proof was needed that everybody belongs to this table, you demonstrated it. Thank you, sir. Plus one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in Telangana, we chose innovation as our USP. We're the only state which said, no, every single thing we do, because we are catching up. As a young state, we have to catch up with all the old established states. And around us is Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, you know, I mean, all strong states, right? So how do we do that? So we decided that we have to bring innovation into every aspect, into every citizen of the state. So typically when people talk of innovation, they talk of industry. Of course we are industry. Then science and technology, of course there's science and technology, but even farmers, women, especially as a category, rural people, social innovation. Just today, one of the reasons Gitanjali I was raised was that we were talking about how do we get people with disabilities involved in innovation. Okay. So every single part of our citizenry has to be involved. And we created separate entities within the what we call as the innovation ecosystem to deal with a number of this. So my organization, Rich, which is one of the seven entities in the state, focuses on fast tracking scientific research to market for quick impact. So we work with researchers, academics, startups, industry, funders, government and society. What we find, of course, is that it doesn't matter where people come from. They are all an integral part. And therefore, to me, there is an artificial distinction between the state and the center. Everyone is an Indian. And as far as I'm concerned, I demand that they do whatever is needed to do. I'll also say this, you know, one of the things which I think Dr. Mitra also mentioned, we've all understood the importance and reason of cross uh, disciplinary fertilizer. And because of my work with scientists, I meet many young scientists and, you know, what you people do is an incredibly high quality work for which I'm, I'm really grateful to you and proud of what you do. But I think there is one or two things that we haven't fully understood. And some of us are grappling with it. You know, we talk of innovation, we talk of research, and my this thing is research and innovation, right? But research is completely different from innovation because a researcher produces new knowledge. An innovator finds a use for that knowledge. And that is again different from an entrepreneur who makes a business out of it. And that is yet different from an institution builder who can take that to scale. So one of my appeals to all of you in India is please recognize your strength and in where it is. And don't start getting confused about, you know, whether I'm an institution builder, entrepreneur, just do the best you can. And it's our job as city clusters and as organizations to find other partners who can take your work to fruition. So we want you to focus on, and this is where, you know, we had many of these ideas, but without the central centers intervention and very strong support and without, because many of these research institutions are in the central sphere. You know, it is not now with the centers and the states working together with the city clusters, what it's allowed us to do is to bring all these partners together on a common platform. And as Dr. Mitra said, COVID in that way was a big blessing because it allowed us to understand, oh my God, we can't do without it. And with it, we can do some amazing things. Right? So now we want to do two big things. First is to tackle some big immediate problems. But the second, which we should not work with, is that what is it that we are going to be the world's leading experts in future? And this is where each and every one of you comes in. Because you are those people who are actually going to be those great experts which will say, no, if you want the best in this particular you have to go to India. So all of us have to work together. It's not just center and state, it's everyone. 
and we have to set our politics and those ridiculous rubbishes that we all do rest of the time apart and really focus on what matters to every single citizen thank you thank you ajit i i could totally relate to every word that you have said and i think all the young scientists listening to us out there not just members of enias i i think what you've said is absolutely bang on we need to know what we do best and continue to do that rather than trying to spread ourselves so thin that we end up nowhere so i i and and there are there are clusters like you there to help us to be able to achieve the best that we can i think this this partnership is extremely important so thank you very much great there we move on to the last panelist of the evening and he's the chairperson enias i will not ask you shaker to tell us what you think about the theme of this panel because it was you who came up with the theme of this panel so you're going to tell us why you came up with the theme of this panel and why you think it is critically important that we have this discussion right here and right now in this time and day please yeah thanks uh, gitanjali and uh, of course other panelists uh for nicely setting up the tone for today's panel discussion uh so yeah i'm associated if you see with inyas uh, since 2017 first as a member then as a core committee member and now from last one year as a chair uh in last couple of years uh, uh, at inyas we have made several successful efforts uh, to reach out to the central science organizations like dst serb and of course psa office uh we we have received a very good support uh from all of them uh meet the inclusion of some of our young members into various pcs of dst and acrb or organizing a prestigious and unique uh, national frontiers meeting of science in 2018 and 19 uh with the full support uh, from bsa office i myself am a part of a few pcs and uh, have been part of this kind of uh, general discussion uh, about the funding support to the state universities versus central institutes or central fund uh, in, uh, universities so having such discussion in back of my mind uh, as a chair we took some initiative of forming our local chapters almost 6 months back and in 2020 especially we worked uh, quite closely with the dst rajasthan as well as you mentioned and few other states and and technology councils uh through our newly formed chapters and that gave us little better understanding about these state science and technology councils uh which is way different uh, that uh, central science and technology organizations work so in fact that actually uh, provided the very genesis of this theme uh in our annual general body meeting because as in inyas uh when we talk about the science communication science outreach Uh, building the scientific temperament we felt that this integration is very critical and uh, what i heard from the panelists i am very glad that already there are some concrete efforts in that direction and i really look forward for a better clarity uh, on the challenges and the way forward to bridge this gap and change the current status yeah over to you gitanjali thank you shaker so with this initial introduction and views of the four panelists on the theme of today's panel i would like to put a general question which by which i mean a common question to all panelists and then we will take the answers from each panelist to the same question to hear what they have to say about it so my first question to the panel is with your experience in your present role to what extent do you think that our research in the r&d central r&d labs can open up to the larger science ecosystem in india and what do you think have been the reasons for the gap between the state and the center all these years and how can it be bridged so that a strong research ecosystem can be developed at the state level we will first take you dr mitra for your answers to how r&d labs can open up to a larger ecosystem in science dr mitra thank you gitanjali well a uh, uh, couple of programs that maybe i would allude to um, you know which uh, uh, ajit did mention about is the establishing of these uh, city clusters you know where we find that we need to leverage the entire ecosystem existing in a city or a region 
uh, where by effectively connecting the five panchatantras, as I call them, you know, which is the R and D labs, the academia, uh, the 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 enterprises, which would include large industries, MSMEs, and and the startups, which is very important, and finally the governments, the central and the state government, all put together. Now we have already established several of these uh, centers, and I'm very happy today. Mukda is here. We have established one in Jodhpur, and that's functioning very well. It's uh, it's actually anchored by uh, IIT Jodhpur, and uh, the meeting that I attended there, the kickoff meeting, the 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 enthusiasm that I found there was much much more than when I saw or had similar meetings in Delhi and Bangalore. Uh, so I am I'm very confident that in smaller cities uh, where the city clusters are formed, they, they will be much more, you know, fire in the belly, which should, so to speak, there uh, to be integrated and solve this problem. And I would uh, uh, suggest that, you know, one of the very important pillars of all these clusters is the state government, uh, the state uh, uh, universities, the state colleges, which we want to integrate in a very seamless manner and open up all the facilities across that is present in central labs and academia to have a copious interaction between the two. Uh, these boundary walls that we have, as Ajit said, these are all artificial. I think it's time now that it's more than 70 years that India has become independent. There's a new vision that needs to be created. And this vision is through a partnership mechanism. And that is very, very critical for us. So, and I think here the young scientists have to play a very, very important role because their thinking is very different uh, than many of us who are great over the years. But then I think uh, we need to have uh, a new vision that, that has to go, a new spirit that not only involves uh, the scientists, but across the stream. What is very important for us to understand here is to integrate the three main, main important things, which is research, education, and innovation. You know, education is knowledge dissemination, research is new knowledge creation, and innovation is knowledge application. And this connection, the dots, you know, they need to be connected. As a researcher, we would like you to, to continue your research. Now, I'm not saying that you should become an entrepreneur so to speak, but then it is our role through these mechanisms to connect these dots together so that at the end of the day, the outcome of the excellent research that is happening is brought to the society. And as Mukta rightly said, you know, the impact of a scientific, uh, of a scientist to the country, to its economy is through this process. And we are trying to enable this process by connecting all these dots together where I think uh, uh, the states are going to be a very, very important player. Um, I would allude to one of the major initiatives that we are taking to bring that forth beside the city clusters, which are there in the four large mega cities, which is Hyderabad, Bangalore, Pune, and Delhi. Uh, we have started with Jodhpur, and very recently we have supported one in Bhubaneswar. Uh, the, the finance minister has announced nine such city clusters, so we would be opening out to other places also to develop these clusters. But a very important development, which many of you would be interested in knowing about, is the National Research Foundation, which I thought Gitanjali has in mind to put forth at some stage. But uh, this is going to be a major game changer and would also address what Mukda just now talked about. For the first time, we will have a mechanism where social sciences will get an equal impetus in terms of funding and its integration with the pure and applied sciences. So NRF's one of the principal role, therefore, is to bring this integration together, which was absent in our country for the last 70 years. That's, of course, one of the important aspects. But one of the very most important aspects of amongst the various things which NRF would do is to support research and innovation in the state universities and colleges. And this is going to be a very important game changer, we feel, because in a country of the size of India, we need to really democratize science. We need to actually, you know, bring in a larger R&D workforce in the country. You know, we have one of the lowest per million. There are only 235 scientists per million population in, 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 in India, which is one amongst the lowest in the world. And so there we feel there's a huge potential in the two tier, three tier cities 
you know, to bring into fold uh, these universities and there are pockets of excellence. So we will help to nurture these pockets of excellence through the NRF uh, and try to integrate them with the mainstream by a different type of program that we would support, uh, which would help them uh, to really, you know, move. You know, in UK we have, they, they have a special program, which is actually, you know, addressed to what they call uh, the uh, the red brick universities or the newer universities, you know, which they actually differentiate with the older ones. Here, it's important for us to integrate the state universities in a big way. There's tremendous potential there. And I think that is where we would work very actively with the states to make this happen. There are several sets of programs that the NRF would support in the state universities and colleges, where I think researchers, the young researchers have to play a very important role as a mentor Young researchers have to play a very important role to support PhDs, to support postdoctoral research uh, in these places, mm, because I believe you are at a stage, most of you come from some of the top places, uh, universities and, and institutions in the country, you have to play a very pivotal role because the state uh, R&D is in a very, very nascent stage. And there are pockets of excellence, of course, there are some universities which are doing great, but I think the hand holding is very critical. If you don't hand hold this, you know, it is going to be frittered away, you know, knowing the various levels of these state universities and colleges where they are, their leadership problems are there. You know, we know these facts. People ask, you know, how do you do this in a place where there is a leadership problem? You know, but there are pockets of excellence. You know, if these could be nurtured and showcased as examples, I think, you know, there would be what I say, we create an ambience of, uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, nurture a competitive ambience within the state so that the states really get, you know, uh, start to emulate. As Ajit just said, Telangana is a new state, but you know, uh, and it is trying to emulate what other states have done. So is Rajasthan and, and, and we are seeing more and more states are coming forward to the office of PSA to help us to connect with the larger ecosystem. So I think it's very critical. We will keep on doing that and, and help proliferate this. Maybe later on, I'll touch upon the STI policy, uh, which also you know, came into being right during the COVID period. So there's been a lot of learning from that. And integration of the state with the center is one of the most important emphasis of the STI policy, which I'll allude later after the other speakers have spoken. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. Actually, that is the next question that I wanted to put to you, the first question I wanted to put to you specifically, but yes, we'll get there. Uh, may I ask, may I ask Ms. Uh, Mugda Sinha? Now, may I ask Ms. Mugda Sinha, what do you think are the reasons for the gap between the center and the state over the years and how can it be bridged, especially from coming from a person in your position so that a strong research ecosystem can be developed at the state level? Ms. Sinha. Thank you, Gitanjali. Uh, uh, I will just be providing uh, understanding from the cutting edge level of what probably in economics they call the viability gap uh, uh, in terms of understanding of what exists in terms of preparedness. When we talk of the, uh, you know, building an ecosystem for the R&D in the states, and as uh, Dr. Mitra has uh, very rightly emphasized, the need to build up that ecosystem in the state universities and college. I will mention, I mean, in fact, I'm going to spill out the secret of what we did in the last one and a half years in terms of understanding the expectations, uh, uh, anticipating uh, the issues in which we would want to, you know, put our expertise and our funding so that we could have some results because in the state, uh, there is a certain Pareto optimality of the budget. Uh, which needs uh, and research, as we all know, is takes a little long in terms of gestation period for to show results. Uh, uh, so that is also something that we have to keep in mind, especially in an ecosystem in the political executive ecosystem where uh, the money that is thrown uh, outcomes are required to be done. So a very, very, you know, Buddha like uh, walking the tight uh, trapeze of the middle path where you have to show some events and you also have to do the substantial part the both the cake and the icing. So uh, the first important thing is that uh, both uh, Dr. Mitra and uh, Ajitji mentioned two things about uh, uh, this understanding of how uh, uh, you know, research, education, innovation, and the commercialization or manufacturing are different things. I would I want to add something which is right now not happening in, uh, in science and research and in the R&D ecosystem. 
and which is something that we all must focus on, which we have started focusing on, which is the monetization of the research and monetization of the research doesn't only have in terms of your technical incubators or the commercialization of innovation, but it can also happen through a lot of, uh, you know, knowledge that is being created. To just give you an example, we have a, a satellite applications research center, which works very closely with ISRO maps all uh, the developmental work and it has been doing that for over the last uh, 50 years because we as a department in in the state are nearing uh, 50 years in two years will be 50. A DST government of India has completed its 50 years but if you see that the atlases which come come out on a yearly or a five yearly basis uh, remain confined only to the government. If we could utilize all the information over a temporal and a spatial period for over the years, and I think Ajit Ji will understand this coming from a IAM background, if we could provide, use the, uh, you know, a, a research institutions to, a, you know, to map the kind of uh, satellite imageries we had, say, from 1990s in the, in any particular sphere, say watershed for that matter, and take it up to this present and then monetize it in terms of writing a small executive summary which says, based on the satellite findings, what we did in 50s, what we did in 60s, what we did in 70s, what we did in 80s and 90s. And this is how the districts in the state of Rajasthan or this is how Rajasthan as a whole in this particular area looks like and make it available. Uh, because I remember when I was working in the government of India and the Ministry of Commerce doing trade negotiations, we would actually buy this data from a lot of companies outside and pay for it. I think this is something that we need to do. Use statistics, monetize those statistics uh, so that that can then be used for research, can be quoted, can be government publication and can be sold out and make a lot of our uh, research, which is happening over the years into something which is uh, which, which adds value. Let me also give you a, sim a similar example in the realm of intellectual property rights. You know, in the field of intellectual property rights, our focus in the States has been on getting uh, researchers patents, right? But unless those patents gets commercialized, that patent is just, a, a, you know, a line in your a bio profile which says, I have 23 patents, but nothing has happened of those patents. Similarly, when you talk of uh, traditional folklore, we are only compiling those traditional folklores, but not providing people uh, who possess the traditional folklore instruments or mattresses uh, using the royalty system to generate revenue for them. Uh, Jharkhand has been able to do that with their Karaknath, uh, uh, you know, the Murga meat. Why can't we extend this kind of a template to other places? Rajasthan has uh, uh, 14 GIs, right? Uh, Karnataka has about 32. We are, you know, using this entire template of the various, you know, copyrights, design, industrial design is going to become so, so very important in times to come. So I think we need to focus on this monetization of the intellectual property rights regime for manufacturing, uh, uh, you know, in the MSME sector, in the unorganized sector, people who hold the GIs, people who are holding traditional folklore. In fact, this is a huge I was looking at the NAFTA desk in commerce and piracy of our uh, tribal songs was such an issue between India and America. And I think if you're not able to evolve mechanisms where this becomes important, so we are focusing on that. Uh, and this is something that we are doing at a very small level. And I uh, uh, hope that in times to come, this will bear some fruits. The other thing that I think that which needs to be done is uh, you know, bringing stakeholders together on cohorts. So today, Rajasthan has about five cohorts in which we have brought everybody together. We have an agriculture cohort, which has about seven universities of uh, agriculture and veterinary all together. So we speak to the vice chancellors of those universities, ask them what you want in terms of research. In fact, MEA recently uh, has a small, uh, uh, you know, uh, vertical called NEST, which is manned by an additional secretary level officer who connects, uh, uh, you know, innovation and research, emerging technologies, as they call it, uh, in various international universities. So I reached out to them and I asked them, why don't you connect my agri and veterinary universities to those people? They are just signing MOUs right now. And those MOUs look good saying that I have signed 100 MOUs with so many universities. <laughs> in terms of 
transfer of technology because transfer of technology is what is actually going to help our MSMEs and researchers come together, innovators come together and commercialize and make it available in the public sphere for people to buy off the shelf those technologies, those innovations are, which are making an impact. So that is the other thing. The next thing is that there is still no recognition. You know, when I joined DST, it was considered, I had gone on a Kailash Yatra so, and during the budget session. So the government had no option but to post me to a so-called lighter department. And today, uh, uh, DST government of Rajasthan has is, uh, is one of the niche departments uh, in the state of Rajasthan. But still the understanding which is lacking is that it is a service provider. We speak so much in the GDP where we talk of the primary sector, agriculture, we talk of the uh, uh, you know, manufacturing sector, we talk of the tertiary sector, which is, which is today 65% of our GDP, which agriculture used to be when I was studying economics in standard 12. But science is a service provider. We can provide service to various uh, departments. Through our science council, we, what, this is what we have instilled in the mindscape of the government that wherever there is any kind of requirement, and we have also done uh, a, a district mapping of the scientific needs of each and every district. So if there is a, any technological gap, like you have a viability funding, uh, you know, viability gap in terms of funding, we are asking our districts today in terms of the viability uh, gap in terms of technologies that they require. Also, what we are doing is each department, I mean, this is not just the scientists working in silos in the scientific laboratories, it's also departments and also policies which are not doing this aerial connection. Right, and I'm just mentioning something. Uh, I'm being very, very candid because I've become very passionate about science. I did not know I had it in me uh, till I till I, I became part of the department. Is the uh, uh, so one thing that I find is that when we do policies, we we did what is called in in the department of women and child. We did something called hygiene, and you know we spoke a lot about sanitary napkins and providing sanitary napkins. Uh, you know, then the movie came, Padman, and so we offered our services and we said that in, as part of the vertical of um, uh, science and society, we are happy to give money to establish and teach, uh, uh, you know, all at least one college in each district, a machine uh, which will enable, uh, you know, um, uh, the women coming from local, lower economic uh, strata to be able to make their own sanitary napkins. We'll teach them a skill which will last them a lifetime by providing the infrastructure. Uh, because the government policy actually provides free sanitary napkins in the schools, in the government schools, but a person who comes from the government school to the government college does not have that facility. So we thought there was a viability gap. There's an expectation. So we met that expectation, expectation to this policy. The other cohorts that I was talking about is we have a biotechnology cohort. We have 45 universities. Uh, uh, we've brought them together. We have a design cohort. This is something I'm very passionate about uh, because design uh, has not found any mention in even the national education policy. And this is my very humble submission. I'm not being critical. I'm just making a small request that uh, we have about 12 universities and colleges in Jaipur itself, we, which talk of design, uh, heritage conservation and architecture. Uh, there, uh, uh, you know, the curriculum is based on physics. Their entrance exam is based on maths, physics, and, uh, and uh, you know, drawing. Uh, but somehow they have not, uh, when I joined the department of DST, I found that no funding was going for workshops and conferences to the design colleges because my accountants felt that design was not part of the science stream. Uh, uh, yeah, so we established a design cohort and I started taking my accountants to these meetings and asked them, uh, exposed them to this uh, understanding and we did not hold any meetings in the government. We went from college to college. The first meeting was held in the government and all other meetings were uh, you know, outsourced to various colleges. They would set the agenda, they would take out the notice, they would do the minutes, I would be present and we would move from one university, one college and then in the, in the one year we were able to hold a design conclave. So my very humble submission is that uh, for the design people, there is no dhani dori, as we call it in Rajasthan. There is, uh, uh, they do not know which, uh, uh, you know, department to go to. So today they come to science in, the, in, in Rajasthan. So that is the other thing I thought I'll flag off. The other thing that is very, very important is the quality of the research. You know, we are at a very, very incipient stage. 
where universities want funding uh, uh, from various places to be able to do research. Uh, we came up with uh, IPR uh, policy guidelines which, in which we developed a, a matrix where the research coming from central government, research coming from state government, research coming from foreign funding or research coming from any uh, institution or any place, we developed a matrix of how the researchers' royalty had to be protected or had to be shared uh, between, depending on where the funds were coming, uh, between the funding agencies, the university or the college and the research so that uh, the researcher felt confident enough to be able to share the research which was coming out pre the patent stage. So we developed an entire institutionalized mechanism. Our policy has been adopted. It was made by experts drawn from different uh, uh, you know, uh, institutions all across the country and it has been accepted uh, by various universities and colleges in our uh, this thing. So we also have an IPR uh, cohort um, uh, uh, and an engineering cohort. So by this mechanism of cohorts, we hold regular meetings. In fact, the biotech cohort was inaugurated by Secretary DBT. In May, uh, we reached out, uh, we did a two uh, day um, uh, you know, conclave called the STRIDE conclave, which is I thought uh, the, an acronym for what actually we do in the department. And that is when we reached out to all academies three secretaries of the government of uh, India, secretary DST, secretary DBT, and secretary DPIIT uh, were our guests for the inaugural session. And uh, thereafter, we have not stopped. We had done more than 100 uh, uh, science communication uh, sessions. We also roped in under the AFSA scheme and did a special two-day workshop for all our journalists from the press, media, social media, and also the public relations officers what you have PIVs in government of India and PROs uh, in our department, we trained them to understand uh, uh, the various policies of science. And today, uh, DST government of Rajasthan is one of the most covered department in the state of, uh, uh, of uh, Rajasthan because we have trained journalists to understand how to write, uh, you know, convert the jargon that happens in research in common layman's language for the consumption of the public. Because somewhere I feel just like an artist who needs validation for the kind of work that is that he's doing, the scientist who is doing so much for the uh, country and for the general public at large also needs validation, but he does not know how that communication will happen. So by getting journalists involved in that, there is a certain kind of validation which is also happening for our scientists community because their whatever little stories, whatever little research they go is now getting some space and also getting the right connection in terms of reaching out uh, to the public. Yes. So that is the other thing that we are doing. And there's a whole lot of stuff uh, uh, that is happening. But <laughs> startups, we have started reaching out to departments and telling them, if you need anything, please tell us. Please include us as a knowledge partners. We'll be happy to link you uh, uh, experts. And that is how we are. See, uh, uh, my job is to connect the dots, uh, to be, uh, you know, to be, to provide a policy architecture in such a manner that all my stakeholders can come together and become part of a problem solving team, whatever the problem be, uh, we can all sit together and find a solution. And so I've only opened the portals of my department and we are very, very happy to have government of uh, uh, India make a mechanism. And this is what I'd also suggest to, to Secretary DST. I've got a lot of support from him, uh, Ashutosh sir. And I'd also suggested to him, sir, if you could like, lot of uh, departments in government of India have very regular meetings. I was secretary food for almost two years and we were all secretaries of the various states were called. So we also had peer learnings from each other. Uh, so if that kind of a mechanism between the DST government of uh, India and DSTs of various uh, states could be developed because I now see that a lot of my colleagues, seniors and juniors are manning DST departments in different uh, uh, states, if you could all be brought together in one forum and, you know, exposed to what the states are doing, even city clusters are doing, I think there will be a lot of peer learning and we will, that connection between center and state is there, but that connection between center making that connection between different states, I think a mechanism for that can be developed. I had offered some suggestions if uh, Enyas or Dr. Mitra uh, uh, feels, uh, we could also write to you, sir and to offer our comments. So I think this is what I'd like to say at this moment. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Zina. Actually, what has happened is listening to you is such a pleasure. I, I had a couple of questions up my sleeve asked to ask you, especially about case studies uh, from your state, but you just now done exactly that. And I noticed that even Dr. Mitra has answered questions on the NRF. So a lot of my questions that I'd listed out for myself to ask you have, are being um, chucked off the, off the ladder. But the thing is, which I would like to say just now to all of our uh, listeners is, if any of you have questions, and I have noted on the chat box that a lot of audience questions are coming in for us, for our panelists, please mention uh, the name of the panelists to whom you want to address your question to. And if you want your question to be addressed to all of them, that's also all right. But please do mention it alongside of your question as to whom you would like it addressed to. And we already have your name, so I would be asking those questions eventually. But coming back to, to uh, Mr. Ajit Rangnikar, and here again, I'm going to move a little bit from the, uh, from the idea of this panel. I was thinking of asking common questions earlier, but I'm going to be combining my common question with a specific question to you, Ajit. The research and innovation circle of Hyderabad, the Hyderabad city cluster that has emerged as such a successful collaboration between the state Have we lost Gitanjali? Yes. But what I want to ask you is how do you think which is going to reduction of effort which happens around us all the time so that the science pillars of industry, academia, and innovators uh, would Your voice is breaking, Gitanjali. Gitanjali, I think uh, Gitanjali, you'll have to repeat the question briefly again. Sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Ajit, my question to you was, do you think the rich HCC, the Hyderabad City Cluster, can help reduce duplication of efforts so that the science community and the society would ultimately benefit from, you know, by synergizing the combined strengths of industry, academy, and innovators? You know, uh, pardon if this sounds a little cynical, but I actually wish there was something that we could think that is being duplicated. Our problem is that we've been working far too much in silos. And what the city cluster is doing is to act, bring it all together. The reality is that, and let's be honest, in practically every institution, there is not even as much collaboration as we would want between departments. Leave alone out. See, as scientists, you people are used to collaboration with people across the world, but that's on your topic, right? When it comes to collaboration across different entities, especially researchers, industry, government, etc., each one of them came with a different expectation, different wants, different perspective. And I think that is where we feel our focus should be. Right? So people, we can find common problems. And again, I think we have beaten that topic to death of COVID, but there we, all of us found common purpose and we did it. But when we look at other issues and bigger issues, how are we going to find a common area to work? And one of the things that we think is going to be, and again, it's my appeal to all of you in India because you are at the core of this. The first thing we need to do is to change our mindsets and acknowledge and expect, accept that we are going to require, it's absolutely mandatory that we interact and work with people across different disciplines, across different areas. And therefore, if you are going to do that, the first thing we need to do is to understand their expectations. You know, we talk of center state, etc. But let's be, I and mean, I think uh, again, Ms. Sina mentioned this in passing and like a good IS officer somewhat politely and nicely, but you know, every state government needs to be re-elected and therefore they need to show something on the ground. Whereas science and scientific things take a long time and may or may not. So there are many things on which we need to understand how other people work, what are their priorities, how, what are some of the things that in which so that we can, second thing is in ISB, the most single most popular course was negotiations. 
and i think every scientist must study its negotiations negotiation doesn't mean what how do i get maximum out of it it is how do i find a win win formula so that all of us can work together the third thing i think we all need to learn is program complex program management you know because you are working with people from all different parts of life and how do you bring them together at the right time how do you make sure that you get all the things you want from it so on and the last which again in a slightly different context ms sinha mentioned but i am a big believer of that is that i think every scientist must learn design thinking you know because when you look at a problem from a solution point of view it's, its usability its ease of use its impact etc etc you approach it from a very different angle so i think those are the things that we need to really look about and not worry too much about you know duplication honestly in science why not i mean in every one of your field there must be a large number of scientists who do the same thing let them do it let's not try and this thing that only x will do this and you know science and research is led by human beings with passion and you cannot dictate passion and you cannot tell somebody that you should not do this at least i personally believe that it is for us who sit behind you to see how we can make the best use of your how we can create collaboration one more thing which i think you know we underestimate scientists are passionate about doing their own science so i if i am taking gitanjali's time i have to be conscious that i am taking her away from what she wants to do the most and how can i minimize that for the maximum impact is something we have to learn and learn. so for us actually the real point is how do we become truly effective in helping you to take your ideas for maximum impact thank you ajit that's a bit of thought there i would have said that if you're taking me away you're not taking me away from my work ever because the ideas that you've given me till now and the support that you've given me till now and the things that i've done it's been absolutely absolutely fabulous for me well moving on to to dr chandrashekhar sharma the chair of inyas uh, i would like to specifically ask you shekhar as a, of course i want to ask you what do you think is the reason for the gap between the state, state and centers but before that as the representative of one of india's most highly funded and globally recognized central science organizations the iit would you agree that central r and d labs are quite arrogant and a lot of us um, outside of the central labs think uh young scientists believe that central labs or research institutions are indeed quite arrogant especially when it comes to opening up or making our facilities uh you know basically our expertise available to uh outsiders and remote labs and universities or people from states how do you think this attitude can be changed shaker uh yes i think uh very uh, nice question well i think i do understand and uh, the concern here and uh, agree to it partially however uh, let me clarify that it's not simply arrogance issue uh, if it would have been simply arrogance issue between uh, well uh, so called uh, central institutes like iits iisars and state universities we could not have uh, come across the situations uh, so often that with even within a given institute uh, we are not able to utilize our resources to the extent uh, possible even in the same department even as uh, dr ajit also mentioned so i mean from my own experience i think there are two aspects of this problem as i understand uh, one it may be easier to formulate the policies uh, centrally for maximizing the utilization of these facilities uh, however uh, we have seen implementation badly fails and uh, i think as these policies are based on the some ideal assumptions which we make uh, while while working on these policies which uh, uh, somehow do not work on the ground uh, for example i'm i'm just uh, i will be very specific uh, in uh, citing this example uh, for example let's say if i own a facility as an indenter and uh, in that process i go through the lot of pain from the very beginning of making the specifications to go to the long procedural uh issues of purchase and then set up the facility and then of course after that maintain to run it successfully now here uh, as far as policy goes we we assume two extreme situations one that as in charge of that facility i have gone through this process which is so time consuming 
and I'm not keen at all in sharing it. That is one uh, assumption we make, and that's what you can call arrogance or whatever. Uh, second extreme situation is after all such efforts, we, we see that as an ideal world, this facility should be open for everyone. And I, I should also be a user just like anyone else. However, I think both these assumptions, both these ideal conditions or extreme situations are not right. As an indenter, I, I think deserve to get some preference uh, in its use. And in fact, I put efforts only when I know that this is the facility I'm creating, which is badly needed for my own research. Second aspect of this problem is more genuine. Even if I am completely willing to share this facility to everyone, including state universities, colleges, and others, uh, which we all are looking for ideally, uh, we, we, we need to keep in mind that most of the time these facilities are run by our own PhD scholars. We do not have the very uh, uh, separate technical manpower to run those facilities. So we simply cannot afford, even if we want ideally, uh, to run this facility all the times at any point of time based on the request. Even it's a chargeable basis, I, I'm sure there's hardly a separate fund maintained in any institute. So when it breaks down, it comes to the same poor indenter to repair it. And again, there is hardly any support from the institute or funding agency. There is no maintenance fund when you write a proposal. So that's a really you know, difficult situation, considering I think only one side of it that uh, it's not going to be used or it's not going to be uh, accessible. I think that's not the complete story. Uh, some institutes have adopted very good practices to maintain and run those high-end uh, facilities. And uh, believe me, it's not a rocket science, but it just needs some consolidated efforts locally within the institute. Uh, there might be some very simple model to hire a technical staff to provide the access to the outsiders for those facilities on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, while the PIE or the department can take uh, use it uh, in the office after office hours. And more and more use of the facilities will also reduce the maintenance uh, as generally thought other way around. When uh, there is so much complexity in these kinds of issues, doing it comprehensively at the national level, I have my own serious doubts for its successful implementation. In fact, I would be more than happy if we can even think of uh, doing it in, the, in, a, in an uh, own institute, if we can utilize our R&D infrastructure within the same institute by providing the seamless access to all, uh, that would also be a great uh, achievement. <clears throat> Maximum, we can think of city clusters. I think that's a very good idea of city clusters for such coordinating efforts. And uh, I think if we go beyond the city clusters, uh, the, we, we, are, we are making the situation more complex. Now, coming to your uh, uh, specific question about uh, this gap between the central institutes funding, and especially when we know that our majority of the students go to the state university and uh, where the research is very limited. Uh, I think, uh, in my uh, frank opinion, we lack the clarity at the top level uh, in the past. Uh, there are some good efforts uh, in the last few years. As we all know that 90 to 95% go to the state university and college where there is almost no R&D infrastructure. Even the top institutes which we are talking about, IITs, ICRs today, uh, they have been involved, especially IITs. Because I belong to an IIT, I can talk more about IITs. They have been involved in the R&D in only last uh, two decades. The brand image of IIT is not definitely due to the R&D. It's more because of the undergraduate education. So of course, now in the last two decades, we have made a decent progress in the R&D as well. So when it comes to the state university, the trend has been reversed somehow. Uh, if you see the before independence, our state universities, colleges were the really powerhouse of our scientific intellect. Uh, however, when we started the new institutes after independence, IITs took a major role into it, uh, we lost the track of our state universities while establishing the new institutes. And slowly that state university slowly became the center of all politics. We all know about it. I do not want to go into that. But I think I still feel uh, I, I, uh, we should look forward. State universities should be given more autonomy to start with, just like any central institute. And similarly, the Central Institute should be given a responsibility to mentor the state universities and colleges in their vicinity. There are some efforts in this direction in the last few years. I really appreciate that. But I think we still need much more than that 
to have a visible impact of this collaboration. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Anjali, I'm going to, I mean, uh, yes. Dr. Chandra has, has finished, I'm going to jump in because I'm very, very passionate about this. Yes, so last, uh, <laughs> I would say, so we, we see conflict. So we, we have a large number of PhDs graduating every year. But on the other hand, the state universities and even the central institutes, we have a large chunk of vacant faculty positions. They, they all go with the ad hoc positions for just for teaching for a semester. So I think we, we must hire those graduates at an early stage and encourage them to take the science, research career even at the uh, state universities. And I think for that, uh, only central science-based funding agencies, even if we go with the NRF, uh, of course, I am still to go through the details of the NRF, how the state uh, um, science and technology councils can be in a part of it. But we cannot just help central science uh, funding agencies responsible for that. That's All right. states have to put in, pitch in uh, for setting up their uh, funds, uh, which are going for the science and technology council in sanctioning the R&D projects, setting up the R&D infrastructure. I mean, it may be a difficult task, but I think it's a certainly doable. We can, when we can have a shared model in, uh, with the GST so complex in so many other sectors between the state and center, Absolutely. why not in science? Why I think that's a question I, I would uh, be leaving. Great. Yeah. No, absolutely, Shekhar. Ajit, you want to come in? Yes, I know. <laughs> you know, uh, I spent 21 years in China, working in China. And you meet and talk to anybody in China they'll never ever say anything against their government. You come to India and no self-respecting Indian will ever say anything good about our governments. Doesn't matter what political, you know, we have to criticize our government. But for God's sake, you know, the population of this country was somewhere around 350 million at the 70 years ago. It's four times now. And only a very small section of Brahminical families and educated families use the institutions of higher excellence. Today, we have been able to educate millions and millions of people with very limited infrastructure. That socialization and democratization of education is something we completely forget. And now with all that limit, and then of course the country has so many other problems of poverty, of farm laws, of this, of that. In all of that, we also expect extra funding to be available for research. I think we have to give our country and ourselves a break. I think we have done a phenomenal job. And as Chandrasekhar rightly said, in the last 20 years that even the IITs have started moving and doing research. I think the new National Education Policy 2020 is a phenomenal document, absolutely phenomenal document. You know. Now it's for each one of us to make that a success. So I'm going to put this ball back into your door. How many of you are willing to quit your you know, top tier institution jobs and go and work in a state university and build that? Thing? I think if each one of us is not willing to sacrifice, then we have no business to complain and to say. I think each one of us has to give up our cushy, comfortable lives and get on and help the nation to go. You know, in ISB, we were extremely successful in using the visiting faculty model. We can do that here. Go for two weeks every term and help those faculty grow, start their programs, do joint programs, start uh, big challenges and work with them. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but if we don't start and if we just complain, I think nothing is going to happen. I am a big optimist. I've seen so many young people do. You know, when we started uh, in uh, 2012, the common complaint was that uh, Telangana, in, in those days, it was AP. AP had 2.5 um, uh, lakh um, engineering students. And the NASCOM said that only 10% of them are employable. So we said, okay, we'll make entrepreneurs out of the rest. And we started a technology entrepreneurship program. I tell you the kind of ideas those people came out with from second and third tier towns, the talent is there. You know, we have to learn how to nurture it and we are getting our act together. So I think, you know, let us, let us instead of talking and saying, let us, 
actually put our feet where those things are and do it. That's number one. Number two, you know, three years ago, CCMB, IICT, uh, and three other institutions, we actually talked to them and said, hey, look, you know, you got a lot, lot of equipment. Why don't you make that open? And Dr. Chandra said, exactly, it's absolutely right. But two things have happened. The center has invested humongous amount of money to start other incubation centers in many of these things. And we, as city clusters, are now saying, you know, if 50,000 people approach each institution and say, I want to use anything, that place is finished. We have to control it. We have to manage it. We have to screen. And we will take 10 or 20 at a time. Right now, on the Rich website, we put up the list of all equipments in most of our research institutions. By the way, the center also has a brilliant website yes. in which you can get everything. So yes. knowledge is available. But think of an education, think of a poor CCMB or IICT. If 50 people start walking in at the door and saying, you know, I want to use this equipment, what are they supposed to do? So it needs an intermediate organization like us. It needs a balancing so that we can actually find which time of the day, how does it not work? Etc. So that, and more importantly, we need to create joint initiatives. You know, if, for example, Dr. Chandra has some really great equipment, but if we create a grand challenge which he's interested in, he'll be very happy to give that. Right? So I think we have we have to create these mechanisms which will actually encourage and not just allow for this thing. I am an Gitanjali, you know this, I'm an incurable optimist and I'm a big believer in the young people. Yes. So I think you people are going to do something that my generation failed. Don't beat yourself up, please. Thank you. No, Ajit, I, I think change, you're absolutely right. There's no way we can change the world. The only thing we can change is mindsets and, the, and change begins with oneself. So it's your own that we can you can change first. As for me to answer your question, Yes, I'm willing to put two weeks for, for being a visiting faculty to a state university. I'm absolutely open to this. Very recently, a co close colleague and partner of mine asked me, oh. kya kar rahe? is it you know, so much outreach that you do? Do you know you're risking your career for that? I don't care if I'm risking my career for that because this is what is more important. And if, we, if I don't do it, nobody else will. And if we do it together, maybe everybody else will someday. So, so Thank you again, but I'm going to move on to you, Dr. Mitra, taking on from the from the side dialogue that that uh, Shekhar had marrowed, and he had said that there has been some lack of clarity at the top level. I caught you there, Shekhar, and I'm not letting you go. So, Dr. Mitra, in the last couple of years, we have seen that how Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor has taken a lead in enhancing and enabling partnerships between the three pillars of science, industry, and academia also innovators. So during the pandemic, particularly in the last one year and a half, you have facilitated this even further by means of initiating the industry-led science and technology clusters that we've heard so much about today. Also the de development of the science, technology and innovation policy, which this question is about, and the National Research Foundation most recently. So my question to you is this, one, where do you envisage the young scientists of INEAS and the 31 science and technology councils in these efforts? More importantly, to what extent did you take the state council's involvement or ask them for their inputs in formulation of the National Science and Technology Innovation Policy? With this, there is a question that Jitendra Patnaik has asked you on the uh, public portal. He says, Dr. Mitra, is it possible to have a common platform where industry, state, government, problem solutions, everything can be done together? And why is it that in India, uh, a lot of collaborations mainly are based on personal collaborations? We, you know, we look at Westerners and their higher education institutes to get some collaborations, but not with within the Indian institutes where potential researchers are available. Dr. Mitra, will you, would you like to take both of these questions, mine and Jitendra? Yeah, thanks, Gitanjali. I'm conscious about the time, I believe you have. This is the last one. Yeah, Shekhar speaking at 7.30, so I don't want to really encroach into it. Uh, I cannot answer all these questions in one go, but I think uh, uh, the young researchers have to play a very, very important role. We are putting in place all the mechanisms that would enable this, you know, opening out our labs, making policy changes, uh, making more funds available uh, through various sources. Uh, we have opened out the corporate social responsibility R&D funding across uh, 
we are now looking at bringing in the ease of doing science, you know, looking at all, you know, roadblocks that are there that we have experienced over the 70 years to change them so that, you know, the connectivity becomes more seamless, which is more important is with the huge amount of resources that is there, both the private sector and the government that has invested across and the bright talent pool that we are seeing, the new startup community that is really coming up, you know, makes me ever optimistic. I'm a strong believer that India is in right in the past. We only have to put the dots together to make this happen, uh, you know, move in a very seamless manner. And we are trying to do it at various level. We are in fact, very shortly, a new platform on academia industry collaboration is going to come up from our office of PSA. Somebody just asked this question that is being addressed. The iSTEM portal, which is India science technology engineering map portal, actually mandates all public sector laboratories who have got public funding to put all the infrastructure and instruments on the portal. And there is an easy access and gateway through which people can access and then ask the PI to get access and then use that infrastructure. And it depends if it is from a university, their own pay, if they are from industry, there are certain modes of doing these things. But you know, we are, we are cognizant of the fact that it is time that this uh, seamlessness has to be done. All our laboratories need to open to that maximum possible way through which there is a two-way flow uh, you know, that takes place. Connecting with the society, connecting with the knowledge economy, democratization of science. Uh, these are some of the new things, you know, the national language translation policy, NLTM program that is going to be launched. All the 32 languages now, we, 22 to begin with, we will look at, you know, helping them to translate all the scientific knowledge into regional languages. This will again be a very powerful way by which we can bring in you know, state universities and colleges on the fold. So I think there are various uh, initiatives that we are doing step by step. The COVID did derail us in a big way, but COVID did give us a lot of lessons uh, um, uh, in understanding our inherent strength. And I'm glad today that the leadership of the country, you know, recognizes the importance of science, technology, and innovation as an important pillar in the future growth of the country, where I believe the young researchers, the young scientists have to play a very important role. They have to break the old traditional mold. I always believe that we have to give wing to the young talent. And that is where the future of the country is. I think it's time. They have a new vision. A new India is being built up. And I think there will be a lot of opportunities. And the underlining philosophy and mantra today is partnership, collaboration, connecting, and that is what is going to make a change in the system. So I'll end here and hand you over to Gitanjali. Uh, you are muted, Gitanjali. Duh, sorry. After zillions of, you know, practice sessions, we do this. But uh, thank you, Dr. Mitra. I um, realize completely that we are, we are absolutely at the end of the time that we had, but please don't worry about Shekhar Mande. He is still five minutes away from here. So I think I would like to sum up, take this opportunity, being the moderator, to take the, uh, you know, the, the chance to uh, give the last summing up myself. It has been, you know, I was going to ask you this, Ms. Sinha, but I'm so happy to have listened to your answers. As I said earlier, you've, you've uh, uh, stumped me all together. A lot of scientists say, and you know, they suggest that the disconnect between the state and center is because a lot of state councils are run by bureaucrats rather than by scientists. And one reason is that possibly the IS officers get posted for a short time. And so they don't have enough time to, to you know, make long term visionary change. Another reason is a lot of people say that most of the popular programs in a lot of successful state science councils are those states like the Punjab and other states uh, we've, where I've had a lot of uh, interaction with over the last two weeks, which are run by scientists. But you Honestly, I wanted to rag you on this, but I take back that question now. You have shown clearly today, as well as in all of your actions, that a positive role model truly are the people who can who can make meaningful change. And it doesn't it doesn't matter then what their pedigree has been. It's what they think today and what meaningful change they are willing to bring to the society. And you've excelled in that. So thank you very much for being where you are. And I hope you continue to do greater things in the future. I have one last question that has been asked by Dr. Mahek Sharma, and she says, and I think I would like to put it to all the panelists. So you all are aware that there are significant number of excellent researchers who need a job currently in India. 
How do you think that we can change the state and central universities, uh, you know, make, make these positions for possible for these highly trained people to take up faculty positions? Do you think there's really a possibility? And maybe leadership positions in these universities do need to be think carefully about for selections? Who would like to take that question? I'll, I'll briefly comment on it. Yeah. It's very important that our education system and research system gets connected with the industries. And that is where most of the job is going to be created. Now, you should understand that 60% of the job today is created in the industry. Industries actually contribute 83% of the economy of the country, of the GDP. It is important, therefore, we connect our research labs, whether it is central university or a central university with industry, so that we make industry-ready products. This, this link is a very, very important link for us to take forward. Everybody cannot be employed within the government system. There is a limitation. And obviously, you know, giving a postdoctoral position is just an interim uh, way of doing it. We do need a good, strong postdoctoral, uh, you know, program in the country, as in US and others. But it's important, therefore, our scientists also have this entrepreneurial, uh, you know, uh, mind of bend. We are seeing a lot of startups now coming up. Uh, this is another new thing. In the, India has now moved into deep tech startup in a big way. So I think it's important, therefore, we train our researchers so that they're connected with the industry right from the beginning, so that the industry can find these places as a place where they can really have their future you know, employees that they can draw from. So this is something that we need to build in our system to make it sustainable in order to provide jobs to our you know, PhD students or postdoctoral or whatever it may be. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. So there's uh, this comment from uh, Dr. Pankaj uh, Kumar at IUAC Delhi. He says that there is a strong need to create more sophisticated, high-end centralized instrumentation facilities, which could cater to the requirement of the state and the central universities. And he's taking off uh, from the points that Shekhar and Ajit had made together. So he, he feels that this will enable seamless running of the instrument, as well as make it available to everybody on the basis of strength of proposal. And I, I have to agree with him there. With that, I would like to uh, sum up this panel and say that uh, I will give a chance to each one of the panelists to give in, uh, put their final remarks. But what I want to say is what we've seen today in the, in the rich uh, interaction that we've had is that most of the issues between either the state and the center, I mean, the state and the center or the state and the locals or the local science community can be resolved or overcome if all of us together as scientists join hands and decide to become or create the change that we want around us by working together with the local science communities in our respective locations. INYAS members, I know in the last five years, while I have been associated with INYAS, INYAS has gone out of its way to do this. And also the wider science community, as well as our new members in INYAS need to know how important this is and how perfectly we are poised to bring about the change that we want around us. So that's my summing up. And I thank everybody who has been, uh, who, who has, uh, been listening to us today, as well as our four panelists for, for being with us today and taking some of the, 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 the tough questions. But most of them were handled so beautifully. And some of the issues that you've raised are very, very pertinent. And I think I'm glad that we've got this video on YouTube so that uh, those who've missed it today can see it later and hear your views and put their comments out also. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe a final goodbye comment from, from everyone. Just 30 seconds, please. Let's hear you out. Um, Ms. Sinha, would you like to say something before yeah, we close? Just, uh, one small uh, uh, you know, response to what Dr. Uh, Chandrasekhar ji said, and then I'll sum up. Yeah. Uh, we have a center for converging technologies here exactly faced this kind of a problem. It was housed in uh, a University of Rajasthan and they wanted to make it a self-reliant center. So they wanted to charge students to use it, right? Mm -hmm. So we said, instead of charging students, why don't you build a good, goodwill by allowing access to everybody to come and use it? You know, there is this kind of uh, insecurity in the minds of institutions which get funded by either DST Government of India or DST Rajasthan. Uh, uh, that this center belongs to us, one. The second is if we open the resources to people from outside, uh, the instruments will get spoiled and then we will not get the money. And this is exactly what is also happening in the science clubs in schools. 
you have a lot of models but the teachers never allow the students to use the models because they feel that the money has been invested so the models are lying locked in the cupboards uh, and the science students are there so i think uh, we must loosen up a little bit so my last and final comment is we must uh, develop policies for access just as you allow resource persons to use the libraries with archival records i think the instrument should also be because the archival records of 1000 years old uh, manuscripts are equally rare equally important i think if we can do it digitize our libraries we can also allow open access so that was a comment which i was provoked into making uh, because of a little conversation we had my final point uh, in today's discussion is with a lot of gratitude because i have learned a lot today that two things should go simultaneously to allow the seamlessness that dr mitra spoke about one is providing structure through institutionalized policy and the other is allowing states flexibility to be able to implement that policy to custom make things depending upon the preparedness depending upon the funds which are available and these two things can go together my very very humble request to all governments is that please do not invest money in construction remove this clause which says that for a science center i need five acres of land in the city please tell me how much do you need in terms of area and please go vertical land is a scarce resource today you know these kind of things is what we need to remove from a policy making to make things seamless let us review these kind of clauses in the policy which make implementation do not do construction do not give it to institutions which already have infrastructure and resources don't build any incubation center in any state give it in universities which have an open it to people i'm very happy about the city thing that i have heard today and develop those kind of templates and do it with industry allow every industrial area i've also worked in industry in the state allow every industrial area to have a research center with all the labs so that industry and research the lab and the industry can work together make it compulsory like you have 75 25% residential 15% commercial and rest um, uh, uh, you know industrial add in that that you will have at least 10% uh, land in every industrial area in every state reserved only for scientific labs if you want plasma and uh, uh, you know medical devices industry you need an ecosystem industry is not coming because the state in investment in scientific laboratories in these industries is required to be done by the governments and only then the industries will be able to come and manufacture so that is my humble request thank you very much everybody thank you ms sinha that was really good uh, coming from you especially today and i would just say ajit uh, would you would you have your final comments and then we can close this panel so i'll just say one thing i hope all of you recognize that you are terrific role models each one of you in india is a great role model and we need many many more young scientists to join we need a talent pool which is many times what it is today and i urge you i really urge each one of you to go out to schools and to talk to young people very few people understand what careers in research and science is we all know about it we all know about manufacturing and commerce and law and things like that so please go out and increase the talent pool of young people who will be attracted to science you people are outstanding i am feel it's a privilege to be able to help and support you good luck thank you ajit where is this from i it should i should take it as a as a signal from cosmos that our time is up and i can also see that uh, shaker mandey is here uh, the the uh, dr professor shaker mandey the director general of csir is here so uh, thanks to everyone on the panel very nice that you could join us today uh, goodbye and good evening and we will move on to the next part of this uh, of this uh, gdm and i i hand over to to inyas chair thank you dr mitra thank you dr agnekar thank you shaker thank you ms sinha thanks thanks dr mitra thanks dr ajit and ms mudla sinha and uh, yeah i think what dr ajit mentioned uh, i will just uh, provide uh, more inputs uh, about inyas and uh, what exactly he is to, uh, he has uh, suggested we at inyas we are doing a uh, lot of activities for the school children and even for the young uh, scholars so 
uh, with this, uh, now we have our keynote speaker for the day. So I request uh, Pooja to uh, go ahead with the proceedings. Thank you, Dr. Chandra, and thank you, Gitanjali, uh, and all the panelists for very such a nice session. I think a uh, uh, very good kickstart for INYAS uh, annual general body meeting. So now moving next, uh, let's start uh, one of the most awaited session of INYAS GBM, that is public lecture by Professor Shekhar Mande, Secretary DSIR and Director General CSIR. Uh, so I would like to remind our audience again that if you have any question uh, from our speaker, kindly post your question in the YouTube chat box. So I'll take this question at the end of his talk. So we are honored to have the gracious presence of Professor Shekhar Mande. We welcome you, sir. Uh, Dr. Mande has diligently spearheaded the task of CSIR resp response towards pandemic. We all are aware of it. And also the Prime Minister call for self-reliant India. Uh, under his vibrant leadership, CSIR has come up with several technologies to tackle pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic, to name a few are uh, some di like diagnostic kits, several drugs, hospital assistive devices, as well as CSIR has played a big role in surveillance and ensuring supply, uh, supply chain. Uh, so without taking, uh, not taking much of your time of our audience, a uh, first request for uh, Dr. Shekhar, uh, Dr. Chandra Shekhar, Chair in Yas, to formally welcome Professor Mande as well as introduce him to our own audience. Over to you, Dr. Chandra. Thanks, thanks, Pooja. So, well, uh, before I formally welcome today's speaker, uh, because he's coming to the Yas platform first time, let me very briefly update him about the Yas activities, especially uh, in 2020. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of this session, uh, the year 2020 has been really extraordinary and the importance of science and scientists to the society has never been so acceptable before. And this brings a lot of new challenges and opportunities for the scientists, especially the young scientists. INYAS has only recognized uh, Academy of Indian Young Scientists, rose to the occasion as was necessary to communicate the science and promote science. Uh, and maintaining the trust of science and scientists in these challenging times. After a thorough panel discussion, now in today's public lecture, we will certainly uh, be guided by uh, Dr. Mande uh, towards our vision and mission. I'm very positive that with the passion and the continued support from one and all, including our parent academy, INSA, and all other well-wishers, INYAS will further unfold its full potential to emerge as a voice of Indian young scientists and continue to serve the society at large. With this, uh, I formally welcome our today's keynote speaker, Dr. Shekhar Mande, uh, Secretary DSIR and Director General CSIR. It's a pleasant coincidence to share part of his name uh, with me, Shekhar. <laughs> so this was really long pending to have you, sir, on INYAS platform. And today and now, in fact, we have that moment. Although Dr. Mande does not need any introduction, uh, for the scientific community, still for the sake of viewers and uh, for a formality, let me briefly introduce him. Uh, Professor Shekhar Mande has done his PhD from Indian Institute of Science in Molecular Biophysics in 1991 and BSc and from Nagpur University. His specialization are on proteins structure and function, biology of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis probed through the structural analysis of proteins, various biophysical and biochemical approaches applications of graph theory to the large scale protein interaction networks, computational methods to analyze large scale biological data. He is fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, National Academy of Sciences and Indian Academy of Sciences and also Andhra Pradesh Academy of Sciences. He is also recipient of several awards to name a few are Shanti Shru Bhatnagar Prize for Biological Sciences 2005 and BM Billa Young Scientist Award 1999. With this, I uh, now request Dr. Mande to deliver his talk. Thank you, Shekhar. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, India, for inviting me and giving me this honor of giving this uh, talk. My apologies first that uh, we had to change the times because of certain unavoidable uh, incidences. And also, despite changing time, uh, thanks to the traffic that uh, we could not, I could not join you on time at 7.30 or something. But thank you all very much for uh, being patient uh, and uh, giving me this opportunity once again for talking. Trust me, uh, as I was talking to you guys, uh, you were uh, saying something about INYAS and other things. 
I was trying to figure out where my slides are because they are still in my mailbox. And uh, also trust me that I am seeing the slides for the first time in my life, what I'm going to speak. So it's more like an extempo, but somebody has prepared slides for me, so I'm going to talk about them. I don't want to take too much time because uh, I've given this talk uh, in many other places. I just want to actually highlight what uh, CSR has done during COVID period, but that's a reflection of the larger Indian science and technology community, what it has done during COVID. So CSR is only happens to be an incidental example. Uh, it's actually the larger Indian science and technology community, what it has done during the pandemic. So once again, my apologies if I sound a bit uh, uh, incohesive because these slides I'm seeing for the first time myself. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. I, I do hope that you see the slides. And I do hope that Yes, Shaker, we can see your slides. No, I need to go also the now yeah. hopefully you're able to see it in the slideshow mode. Yes. Right? Okay, so pleasure, privilege to be with all of you. I'll take probably about 20 to 30 minutes to talk about this. Now, CSIR, as all of you know, is an organization that was set up in 1942. Uh, we are an independent society, autonomous society. Uh, the president of our society is the Honorable Prime Minister. And the Vice President of the society is the Honorable uh, Minister of Science and Technology. Uh, so that's how CSIR society has actually been uh, 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 formulated in 1942. On today's date, we have about 37 labs across the country. And uh, we span many different areas of science and technology. If I were to actually divide India's uh, period, overall period, in four different areas, uh, 1942, CSIR was the only publicly funded science and technology organization in the country. All other uh, SNT organizations, Department of Atomic Energy, Space, DRDO, ICAR, ICMR, all of them came after independence. So there was a period of 1950 to 70 of self-reliance. Uh, you are aware of the agricultural revolution and all. There's a period 1970 to 1990, roughly about technology denial. You are aware how defense technology and all developed in this. And there is an era of globalization, which we are passing through right now. And CSR has contributed in each of these over the years. And CSR continues to do so even in the modern times that anytime there is some situation that arise, including some of the uh, critical situations, such as the Vizag gas, leaks, Vizag gas leak that you see on the right-hand side, the person's wearing helmet and looking at the ground. Uh, CSR went and figured out that it was styrene that was actually leaking. The above just about that you see Assam oil fires and as recent as the tragedy in Uttaranchal, CSR scientists are always on the ground and immediately provide support to all agencies around that we do. On the left-hand side, you see CSR's Aroma mission in which we have installed distillation units across many, many different places in the country. And we have promoted growth of aromatic plants and has given livelihood and has enhanced incomes of many farmers across the country. When we come to COVID-19, we should thank our predecessors since independence that have actually generated a very, very uh, vibrant scientific ecosystem in the country. You know, India adopted SNT as the primary driver of uh, uh, our society. And it was so, so fantastic. About 60 or 70 countries became independent in that period of about 10 to 20 years. Trust me, about 60, 70 countries around the world became free of their colonial powers in that era. India stood out because India decided that it is going to adopt science and technology as the driver of its growth. And the results are there to be seen. Just look at our neighborhood. Just look at Sub-Saharan Africa. Just look at Southeast Asia. We actually stand out for what we have done over these years. Trust me. On 15th August 1947, the Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister, what was he doing? 15th August 1947, country had just become independent. Country was for, for passing through one of its most challenging phases in the history. There's a large scale human migration taking place. What was Prime Minister doing? Prime Minister was found in his office writing the bylaws and objectives of CSIR. 
that is the support that indian science and technology has enjoyed over the years from the public from the political establishment it just amazing in the 60s and 70s the country decided that it is going to generate a wind tunnel can you imagine india decided to generate going to generate a wind tunnel in bangalore and that was established in national aerospace laboratory the entire growth of our space sector the entire growth of our defense sector large part of it credit can be given to this one facility that we actually generated and imagine space how much investment india made in space when i was a graduate student and when i was young faculty like you there used to be frequent criticism of india's space program aslv there was a, a, a common joke amongst people and very bad joke it was said it was aslv's automatic sea launching vehicle that means the moment uh, the space vehicle goes up next moment it comes down into the sea the scientists had to sustain this criticism from everyone then people like professor satish dhawan people like dr abdul abdul kalam sustained all the criticism and remained at their particular job and that's exactly what is called as character and we all belong to that particular character in which despite all the severe adversities despite all the challenging situations we as community always stand up and covid 19 is no different than standing up situation the entire science and communicator technology community in india has literally stood up and shown to the world what we are capable of i am showing you here on the left hand side what were the challenges and unmet needs when csr directors met on 25th 26th february last year believe me who had not yet recognized covid-19 as a global pandemic we did not know what are the point of care diagnostics there are no therapeutics we knew that the virus is highly contagious we knew that it leads to respiratory failure in critical patients yet we had capability in the country we knew how to sequence we knew how to analyze the sequences we have sufficient capability in diagnostics we have been the fountain head of generic pharma industry around the world we have huge expertise in engineering and we have great capacity in r&d and infectious diseases so what was the need and what was what we possessed when we mapped that we were able to roll out a strategy what we call as the five prong strategy of csir and the five per vertical pillars of the strategy were rapid and economic testing for diagnosis digital and molecular tracing for surveillance new drugs repurposing drugs vaccines as interventions hospital devices and supply chain logistics system the two fundamental principles that we followed that we will necessarily have an industry associated with us in any innovation that we have we will not work without an industry participation on any of the technologies that we are going to work on i have personally wrote letters to all industry leaders in the country mr mukesh ambani mr chandrashekharan mr baba kalyani dr kiran muzumdar shaw i wrote personal letters to all of them trust me in 24 hours i had replies from all of them saying that they were great believers of indian science and technology and they look forward to working with csir and for that matter with larger community in india of science and technology and in collaboration with all of them we are able to bring out many many innovations i am going to rush through my next few slides giving examples of those that is first principle that we worked with that we are going to work with industry the second principle that we worked with was we are not going to evolve a technology which requires large imports and therefore anything that we do has to be available in india that was the seeding of what the honorable prime minister calls as atmanirbhar bharat with these two principles we started working on and actually all of you are aware there is a diagnostic kit that is available in the market today it is based on crispr cas technology it is a paper based test you dip the paper in a solution you get a band if you are covid positive you don't get a band if you are covid negative sensitivity and specificity matches rt pcr is about half the price of rt pcr and takes only 45 minutes to do as against about 3 to 6 hours of rt pcr the kit is available 
and is now being deployed by Tata Sons all across India. We also came up with innovations. Our students and our young faculty members in Hyderabad, they came up with innovation which we said, which they said, you don't need to transfer virus in a viral transfer medium. Viral transfer medium, in a sense, is an inhibitor of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase or reverse transcriptase. But you don't need to transfer virus in viral transfer medium. You just ship it dry. And then you don't need to isolate RNA. By simple tweaking of the protocol, if you do this, you can increase the throughput of your testing by threefold. And you can drop the price by about half. Imagine what kind of innovation that is. And this innovation is now adopted by Apollo hospitals across the country. This innovation has been adopted by SpiceJet in their new venture called Spice Health. I will not go through this. In terms of surveillance, we have been sequencing large number of viral isolates across the country. We have sequenced more than 5,000 isolates on today's date. We have also devised a zero surveillance system across the country. And we have about 10,000 people whom we are surveying continuously across the country as far as zero surveillance is concerned. That is the uh, CSIR cohort. We also have been surveying sewage samples. It gives you good idea of early outbreak of the disease in certain localities. We have been able to do airborne survey. Our labs in Hyderabad and Chandigarh, Imtech Chandigarh, CSIO Chandigarh, and CCMB Hyderabad have been able to demonstrate unequivocally that the dominant mode of viral transmission is through air. We have been trying to convince WHO that the dominant mode is through air and not through contaminated surfaces. And this has been possible because we've been able to do the study on airborne transmission of the world. So these are the kind of thing that we have done, serology we have done. We are repeating the serology every six months of all the employees. And then it has given us enormous insights into how people are actually, we are finding antibodies in people and how virus is sweeping across, is washing across Indian population. And a fact that India's numbers have dropped so dramatically in the last six months is also is a reflection of the fact that we have actually been able to see many different people into uh, viral things. Uh, let me come to uh, the uh, drugs. We have been able to actually uh, generate many of the uh, uh, repurposing drugs. Uh, I'll just give an example of Fabipiravir here. We got emergency approval from uh, the Drug Controller General India, and it is being marketed uh, in the field by CIPLA under the trade name of Ciplinza. And we're very proud of our ICT people who have been able to do this. But apart from that, we also have clinical trials, phase three clinical trials going on on Sepsi VAC. This trial should get over in a month from now. We brought for the first time a CQH, a plant based, extract, based, a plant based extract, for the first time in a mode called phytopharmaceutical. And we also have been doing plasma therapy. So they're the kind of thing that we have done. And a large number of clinical trials on today's date are going on in terms of many different uh, things that what we have been doing in this particular case. In terms of uh, medical devices, one of the things that we are very proud of is this first Vayu ventilator. It's a non-invasive ventilator, ventilator that National Aerospace Lab uh, made in, uh, in Bangalore. And as many of you would be aware, we just completed supplying 1,200 ventilators to the Delhi government last week. And this is actually a very good ventilator. It's non-invasive, it's a bi-level positive airways pressure, and therefore can be used even for people who have sleep apnea and so on and so forth. We have been able to make makeshift hospitals. Any corner of the country, when you run out of hospital space, when you run out of hospital beds, our scientists are able to go there. In five days flat, our, our scientists can make a hospital which is 50 bedded or 100 bedded hospital, as you see here today. Five days, they can make a hospital which is 50 or 100 bedded hospital. And our first of the orders in Himachal Pradesh, Six different locations, remote locations in Himachal Pradesh. It just got over. The Honorable Vice President of India, four days ago, dedicated that to the nation. So imagine the kind of innovations that have gone through. And we are so proud that because of innovations such as this, Indian science and technology community, I've just given you the example of CSIR, but the entire Indian science and technology community, in partnership with private companies, 
And I would like to acknowledge only a few private companies on this particular slide, but there are many, many more in partnership with startups, in partnership with MSMEs, and with the backing of political support, and with the backing of Indian people, we have been able to demonstrate what is the power of science and technology to the society today. I want all of you young scientists out there to be very proud. When you reflect upon 50 years from now, on the period 2020, 2021, you'll be all very proud that we belong to that community which stood up and brought so many innovations to the country. We have been able to jointly together, together with industry, together with general public, and together with political support that we enjoy, we have been able to slow down the pandemic much, much better than many other countries, the countries which pride themselves with a much better healthcare system than what we have. Be proud. We belong to that community which has done this. Imagine, when the virus was breaking out in India, the numbers that were projected that India would sweep through, people expected two, 300 million people by September last year would be infected. And even if you considered only about 1% of this would die, just imagine how many people were expected to die of that. Any number close to 1 million to 10 million was expected number of people that would die of COVID in India. That did not happen. On today's date, we have only 150,000 people that have died. That's unfortunate. But yet, we have done way, way better than the countries who pride themselves of better healthcare system, better human development index, and pride themselves with higher GDP. We are very proud of this thing. This is the CSI technology compendium that is available. I would wish uh, all of you could actually go through this and uh, actually show to all your friends what India's science and technology community has done from here onwards. So I'm going to actually stop here because I don't want to take too much time of this. Uh, I know there could be plenty of questions. Gitanjali had actually said that I should also talk about myself, which I'm a bit uncomfortable talking about myself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my slides, but instead what we can do is uh, we can actually have a uh, question and answer some of our you, but not before once again emphasizing the fact we belong to a community which has stood up always since beginning of our nation, 1947, when there was a need. Trust me, when the British left India, just a few years before that, about one to three million people, about 10 lakhs to 30 lakh people had died of hunger in the country. We changed that. The science and technology community stood up. We brought green revolution to the country. Organizations like CSIR brought mechanization of agriculture to the country. Organizations like CSIR brought all the uh, things that are used in the field. Together with ICR, we stood up and made sure that we become food, food self-reliant. When the technologies were being denied to us, yet we were able to launch satellites on our own. So much so that different countries line up today when there is the next launch, different countries come to India to launch the satellites. We became self-reliant in many of the defense technologies. And yet we have been actually able to march on and we have demonstrated that once again, all over again during the COVID period. So be proud. And we have a lot of expectations from your generation. 20 years from now, uh, when I'm old enough, I want to actually look back and come to all of you and ask you, tell me what are the you then that you makes me proud of that. And that confidence I have in all of you together will make a difference. Together will make, will bring value to our people in the country. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mande for a wonderful session and uh, making all youngsters, all audience out there aware about uh, the key role played by CSIR. Uh, we all have faith in Indian science and technology, all the science organizations. We have seen how it, the different science organizations played a role here. And CSR being one of them has always been in forefront. So there are a couple of questions from uh, INIAS members. So I would put that to you. So the first question is from Dr. Jitendra Patnaya. Uh, he is asking why after independence, why there was need to have different organization to combat with our requirement for science, technology, and strategy. Most of the time, we see our military medical science requirement are controlled by different organization, and each one has specific goal, objective, priority. 
So your views upon that? You know, Jitin, what happens is that uh, in engineering, there is a common principle that robust system always are made up of redundant system. There has to be sufficient redundancy in any system that will only make a robust engine. I mean, that's how the engineers actually always work with. Now, if you have to support science and technology in India, there has to be redundancy of funding. There has to be redundancy of support, public support on that. And therefore, it was important that we have different, different organizations which complement each other in their strengths. So we have ICMR, which primarily looks at a uh, lot of surveys and uh, uh, different kind of things, uh, looks at different diseases that are breaking out and so on and so forth. We have space, which essentially looks at uh, launches of the space satellites and so on and so forth. We have DBT, DST, CSIR, which have their own mandates to do that. So it was important that we have different, different organizations which do that. At the same time, we must realize that each organization is aware of each other's strengths and weaknesses and we must learn to complement each other. Only when we try to actually complement each other and work together, that we can bring value to the entire ecosystem that we have. Thank you, Jitin. Uh, continuity to his question, uh, he's then asking, most of these organizations, they are based on military and medical science requirements. Only few are focused on looking of the requirement of the normal people. They are generally uh, treated as large stakeholders. So what is your say on to that, sir? Uh, I don't think that criticism is valid. Uh, normal people is always at the heart of all of us. I mean, you and I belong to the same community, right? I mean, all of us in this audience belong to the same community. And all of us want that a common man must benefit in the end of what we do. We have that empathy for another human being. We have the empathy for everything that surrounds us, the plants and animals. And we have empathy for our environment. So all of it put together, every scientist wishes that his or her work eventually translates into the benefit of everything around us. And a good number of examples that can be given, we have been able to actually, you remember, I mean, our population was deficient of iodine at some point of time in 1970s. That's where the iodized salt was uh, introduced. And that came from research of ICMR. Uh, Dr. Ramalinga Swami at that time, who was leading ICMR, he actually realized that there is deficiency of ID across India. Similarly, there are many other cases. We knew that there's polio in the country. Many of you are born after 1970. You don't know that before 1970, smallpox, there used to be sporadic outbreaks of smallpox in the country. So last of the smallpox cases in the country was there in 1974. Most of you are born after 1974. So you don't even know what kind of deadly disease smallpox used to be. Similarly, polio. We have been able to get rid of polio. And it is all towards the common people. Keeping the well-being of common people ahead of us is what actually all of us have worked on. Having said that, all our challenges are not over. There are plenty of challenges lying ahead of us. There's rampant use of groundwater. How do we ensure that uh, we have actually sustainable groundwater resources? There's rampant use of uh, non-renewable energy resources. How do we ensure that our environment is protected by using renewable energy sources? Right? There's rampant use of arsenic. I mean, the groundwater is contaminated with arsenic. How do we make sure that our population is protected by arsenic? These are all problems of the common of this particular era. And we must all work together to make sure, first of all, we should identify the problem that a common man faces, and then we should work together to find solutions to this common man's problems. If we do that, as I said, you'll make me proud in the next 20 years. Yeah, I agree with you, sir. And I think common man is, is the most, uh, you know, the one of the most critical stakeholder for the science and technology. It's the government, it's the money, which is taxpayer com money coming from the common people. And uh, we are working for them only. Uh, now I'm moving to the next question, uh, which is from one of our viewers. Uh, from YouTube platform. The question is, some of uh, the collaborators from CSIR are not happy as they are deliberately being stopped not to collaborate. This is really a threat to everyone's scientific ambience. As DG CSIR, what is your opinion on that? So uh, it's unlikely that the collaborators have been threatened not to collaborate with someone outside. It's very, very unlikely. Puja, you are from CSIO. Uh, 
have you been told not to collaborate with outside anyone till now i no for my personal experience never but i think somebody some some might have the experience so if there has been an experience let me know uh, we can actually correct that uh, because many different people come with different kind of colors and many people don't have actually even time for doing that you know i mean i am myself overwhelmed with so many different activities that if i start doing everything on my own i would find it tough to do that and probably that's true with many people that could be one possible reasons but it's unlikely that somebody has been asked not to collaborate with someone else and if that has happened i think that's really bad we as scientists must be open to everything all the ideas around us and to the best capability of us and to the best time available to us we should try to strike balance and together we should try to bring value to overall thing that what we do that's what i believe and that's what i would like all of you to believe this particular issue uh, right sir there is one comment also i would like to even make uh, the young people aware here uh, that one comment from one of the member is uh, there uh, about usable consumer products that have not come from csir um, even i would like to as as csir family i would like to inform that uh, since uh, our 8 years of csir is being celebrated by showcasing different technologies being developed by csir so i would urge all of you to kindly attend those sessions and uh, so that you get more aware about kind of technology csir has given to the society even to the common people you would like to add anything here sir uh, about the usable consumer products from csir maybe some some so so we have plenty of things which are coming up all the time uh, we have i mean the fmcg sector we are particularly strong and uh, also promoting uh, say something like food to eat the conservation preservation of food and so on and so forth uh, if you go to uh, the gm platform or some of the other things you will see that local foods of different geographies in the country is what we would like to promote for example right and all of you agree with me that the food that manipuri people make is very tasty food and many of us would like to taste that but we don't get that opportunity unless you visit manipur many times and we are trying to promote that if that food can be preserved there in cans and can be made available in rest of the country the himachali food the kangda uh, kangdi dham that you talk of that's so tasty so superb and many people would like to actually taste that and many of us have not had the chance to taste it i have had the chance to taste it personally and i can vouch for it that's superb actually it's outstanding but how do we promote it across the country and csr technologies are actually trying to do that at this moment across the country similarly many other consumable goods we are working on those and uh, we are trying to actually promote uh, some of those uh, across the thing once again the challenge is how do we uh, tie up with industry and how do we scale that up that's always a challenge for all the scientists and technologists uh, right sir and i must mention under your leader uh, leadership csir has branded its technology to a large extent and uh, i think uh, it has uh, go, gone to every common uh, place every common uh, person is now aware and even with the science outreach kind of initiative taken by csir it is go, uh, reaching to even to the schools level children level and then to the family level finally to our stakeholders uh, so there is next question uh, from gitanjali what message do you have for young scientists who think that research and outreaches are exclusive almost like the near impossible holy grail of work uh, life balance how did you resolve this in your career research and what uh research and outreach are okay. how did you uh, manage to balance both in your career maybe you could put forward outreach that. outreach you mean public outreach is it yes. uh well uh, i have not done well at all in this uh, 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 uh my research has been good to some extent maybe we can call some uh, some of my papers are excellent they have not been outstanding there is number one so i am very aware of the particular fact that i have really not done outstanding work in my career but maybe excellent work uh, to some extent my outreach has been not that good but i would have loved to be much much better than what i am in terms of outreach and our challenge is how do we actually reach to common people how do we reach to school children so that they become excited in science how do we reach to, uh, to the parents who influence the children's decision uh, making and so on and so forth and we have not been able to very uh, good in doing that and that all of us can collectively address i'll just tell you an incidents uh, that happened in real life uh, my son after 12th he was pondering what to do 
and he told us that he wants to do science so i said yeah i'll do whatever you like to do so he actually was interested in mathematics he said if you do whatever you like i mean there's no issue uh, we'll support you whatever you do so for his admission we went to multiple places so i was at aisar pune uh, he was called there for admission and uh, i was sitting in the audience like many other people uh, just uh, being part of all the parents who were sitting there and at some point of time one of the parents realized that there is scientist sitting amongst all of us because all of them had come to put their children in a science school right aisar pune and then in no time there were about 100 people around me surrounding me and they were looking at me as if i have come from a different planet right? like i am come from mars or something and they were asking me question that do you get to eat food for both the times do you get time to spend your resting in science how do you survive i said come on crazy i am like any one of you i have not grown long hair i have not grown a beard i don't keep looking here and there like this i am a common man you know so okay, there is a kind of uh, concept that people have that unless you are an engineer or a doctor you cannot lead a common lifestyle and we are uh, living examples of all of this that we are common people and we are pursuing our uh, what we actually think is good for everyone and uh, that passion that we are pursuing must be translated to the society that we are very very passionate of what we are doing our passion is to discover new things our passion is to advance the frontiers of knowledge our passion is to transfer this frontiers of knowledge into technologies our passion is to bring benefits of these technologies for the benefit of society that's all of us believe that we are going to do each one of us will find our niche into any of the thing that i mentioned just now in simply advancing the frontiers of knowledge is fine generating technologies from the knowledge fine transferring the technologies for the benefit of science fine but all of us are passionate in doing that and we are committed for doing excellent work in the area that we choose to yeah right sir very nicely you uh, shared your own <laughs> uh, case and i think that perception that perception still exists even if we go to schools talk to students even to the common people uh, they think that scientists they don't have their social life you know they are like still like with you know here big hairs and uh, <laughs> that perception still exists and uh, we as a inyas mm-hmm. members are also trying to get rid of it and make students you know there is a uh, enjoyment in this career they can still have their uh, you know social life while pursuing their pa- passion so that is what even inyas is striving for so next question is uh, from dr praveen uh, what is the vision of csir as far as green energy is concerned personally for green hydrogen fuel yes so uh, as i said uh, we are a very future looking organization and i'm so proud that we have so many scientists who are actually working on many of these areas so specifically coming to green hydrogen we have a plan that is rolling out very soon and you will see the plan that comes out so hydrogen actually there are multiple issues that are involved in that issue number 1 is of course how do you generate this hydrogen you know there are multiple technologies either you split water you use solar energy to split water or you use membranes uh, pfmc for this or something so with the way you actually generate hydrogen is one issue the second issue is how do you store it the storing of hydrogen also is challenging today and the third issue, issue is the use of this uh, hydrogen how are you going to use it so for example we have demonstrated recently that hydrogen can be used in car and ncl pune national chemical laboratory pune and kpit pune together actually for the first time demonstrated that a car can be run on a clean hydrogen uh, fuel in pune but uh, it's not a very economical option we believe that large buses and all would be much more economical using hydrogen fuel or something so our strategy for green hydrogen fuel is still in the formation right now but we are expecting by middle of april the strategy would be rolled out and we are getting some of the best known people in the country on board who would actually work with us in uh, rolling out that particular strategy Uh, right sir so um, i'll take uh, next question because now we have got a lot of question in the chat box uh, so not wasting time the next question is uh, now we are talking about technology and product development uh, now there is also a public view that the ancient technology is far better than the existing one and marketing strategy uh, strategy is also highlighting same so how to uh, overcome that or what are the solution way out see what has happened is that the way in india we learned our science after 18th century is the way the british taught us now let us accept this particular fact 
and i would recommend many of you to hear to shashi tharoor's talk uh, what he actually talks about so in our history textbooks we have been told that we were actually a barbaric population we did not know anything we were uneducated we are not even a single country we were poor we have been exploited by our emperors and that's how we were and magic somebody came from outside to this country and changed that and taught us that we can democratic taught us that we can actually adopt science and taught us that how we can educate ourselves now that complete narrative is a false narrative right in fact we need to go back to the british and tell them if anyone was ever more barbaric that they were more barbaric you know india's contribution to world economy was 27% when british arrived here in the 18th century 27% when british left it had dropped to about 1% india's contribution to world economy the british made sure that we don't produce our own cotton uh, our own uh, clothing all the cotton that was being produced in west bengal and all the entire textile industry in places like murshidabad and all were destroyed by the british by putting very heavy taxes and in fact if any person was seen to be making textiles their hands were cut by british all the cotton was taken to manchester the fabric was made there it was brought back so that we can buy that fabric so this is the correct narrative and this narrative must be told to everyone in the world that history has been wrong on indian thing we have been taught wrong things in indian history we come to 18th century science there was a delegation that came from royal society a big delegation that came from royal society to india and it is documented in a very fine book by dharam prasad 18th century science and technology in india he went to royal society he looked at all the libraries and all the papers that were presented in uh, royal society at a particular time he has chronicled them in this particular book and it was phenomenal the kind of things that people were able to do in india at that particular time right for example there is a person who was doing skin draft right skin drafting was actually already known to indians at that time there are people who are doing very advanced metallurgy at that time you know the evidence of a lost wax technique of making uh, k- 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 beautiful atoms out of brass and so on and so forth existed in harappan times 5000 years ago we were extremely good in metallurgy as late as 1910 or 1911 only about roughly 100 years ago the leading pharmacy in the world was led by a person called henry welcom some of you here are welcom trust fellows just like i was welcom henry welcom made wealth out of uh, his pharmacy eventually it merged of course with glasgow skip smith klein and he runs a big charity organization henry welcom told one of his physicians pyra mall go to india there is a huge knowledge that exists in medicine ransack the knowledge and come back to england not before you have ransacked that entire knowledge and tell me how indians actually practice medicine 18th century person when he came to india he has chronicled what was the tikka practice in bengal in the era of 16th and 17th century learned people would go from banaras to all over india and inoculate them with tikas so that smallpox would not be there edward jenner's vaccine is 1797 tikka practice existed in india and china much before that now this is not to say that science was so well developed that was better than today's science okay i have not said that science has definitely moved from that particular period till today right but we must continuously keep learning of what is current today's knowledge current knowledge we must take into account how things were done in india we still don't understand many aspects of how people have done them historically you know simple fact that people could actually predict when is going to be low tide and high tide on in the oceans it was so easy for people to do that they had done the panchanka evolutions and all they knew exactly what time high tide low tide would be there and i need to learn from that so science always develops by building up upon the current state of knowledge and we have not yet learned what all existed in the past and our knowledge would be only complete if we learn what has been known and not what has been taught to us by the imperial uh, uh, powers that be at a particular time 
and must that actually existed even before the imperial powers came here. And if we are able to understand that, I am pretty sure our future will be even better. I have not said that the people in ancient India knew better than us. So don't take me wrong. That's not the narrative. The narrative is to build up upon the current set of knowledge, and we must do better than what is known currently. Right, sir. I think even the documentation of the ancient science and understanding uh, that rich science available in our history is very much important. And also the marketing, uh, which I think India is very much poor in probably in that aspect, uh, marketing our own science, our own knowledge, even uh, the traditional science lying with us. Uh, so moving to the next question, which is from Dr. Pankaj. Uh, like as we CSIR is successfully conducting GRF exam uh, for the students, for PhD students. So what do you think that if having a centralized recruitment of scientists or staff in all central institutes, similar like UPSC, could help in uh, to overcome the biases as well as inbreeding in the recruitment? Yeah, so Pankaj, uh, there, are, there is an advantage and there is disadvantage of centralized recruitment, you know? So uh, advantage is that, as you correctly say, that many of the biases can be removed. And some agencies such as Department of Atomic Energy conducts this uh, the test that all of you are aware of, the training school uh, that it does. Similarly, DRDO has a common exam, ICR has common exam and all. And I have the advantage that actually people chosen there can be placed anywhere according to their thing. But a disadvantage is that many people, many institutes which are small in place have their local needs, you know universities and so on and so forth. And therefore, there should be sufficient flexibility given to appreciate that local need. And therefore, those recruitments can be done locally. So we cannot say that centralized recruitment is better or decentralized recruitment is better. We cannot say either. And there has to be a room to have a mixture of both of these uh, as correctly pointed out. We have seen over the years that many universities and all have actually done inbreeding we have seen over the years that many of the places have actually not recruited people of high caliber. And remember, one thing that characterizes institutes of high caliber versus those of low caliber is the people in them. You know, all of you are here in India because you are considered to be allies of Indian science in the next generation. And you are very high caliber. You would not have been here if you did not have that kind of caliber. And institutes are built upon people who are of very high caliber, people who are excellent, people who are outstanding. And institutes are built upon on those people. So when you people come to a situation in which you are recruiting people for your organization, at that time, remember, please do not compromise on a person who is coming into the organization. The capability of a person who is coming into an organization is of paramount importance for that particular organization to grow. And let us not actually forget that particular aspect when we are doing our recruitment. Uh, right, sir. So we'll now take the last question, even though there are a lot many questions which are coming into the chat box. Uh, as from your experience, from your career journey to uh, even as a, you know, guidance to the INIAS young member, can you comment upon why uh, India uh, or why in Indian science, we are not able to bring out journals like Nature or IEEE in India? And what would be your guidance to younger generation to focus upon these domains to bring uh, Indian science to an excellent level? Yes, that's a very, very nice question. I really like this question. I think we have to make now a concerted effort that our journals, our journals should come to the same quality. And as they say, charity begins at home. We have begun this exercise in CSIR. You know, in a journal, the only way the journal can come up in quality is basically to have a very strong editorial practice, very strong editorial policy, and all the editors who adhere to that particular policy. So if you actually are able to adhere to that particular one and start attracting more and more people to uh, submit their papers to these journals. Remember, many of the fundamental papers were actually published in journals such as Current Science and Indian Journal of Physics and Pramana and so on and so forth. You know, even people like C.V. Raman and all, we are routinely publishing in these particular journals. My own field is crystallography. I've been trained as a crystallographer. And there's a phenomenal crystallographer called G.N. Ramchandran. In 1960s, he published a paper 
called apparent paradox in crystallography that actually about to do something about the magnitude of phases and the magnitude of the structure factors and he published in current science you know that paper this phenomenal paper is even quoted today so this kind of things actually have been published in indian journals and it's our collective responsibility now that we bring back that glory of our collective journals by putting in place strong editorial board strong editorial policies and strong ethical practices if we are actually able to do that i'm sure we'll be able to rise to the occasion and bring our journals to the same level as many of the international journals today yeah just to add uh, i'm happy to inform that enias is seriously considering uh, the thoughts in that direction and in fact uh, day after tomorrow as a part of this this gvm only we have a brainstorming session uh, on that aspect and uh, not only that uh, in last uh, two years uh, in uh, enias has edited a special issue the two special issues are already edited of proceedings of insa that are completely edited by inias and we have published uh, all inias members have published one paper into it and third special issue is also in the pipeline so that's another area where uh, inias is really looking for contributing towards the indian science by publishing into the indian journals thank you shikhar right sir thank you sir we hope that inias we ensure you that inias member would uh, take it and uh, pass on the quality Uh, to the younger generation and uh, contribute to the excellence of indian science so at the end i would like to thank professor mande for uh, your really valuable insights listening to you is a uh, highly motivating every time and thank you for uh, your time from your busy schedule we look forward to have your presence in future in events of inias most probably in presence uh, in physical meetings um as an announcement to our audience the next public lecture under gbm will be by dr sahi jamil which will be on 20th february the uh, session will be open to all the general public i also request all inias members to join tomorrow for the inias general session at 5 pm uh, with this we close today's session thank you very much sir again and thank you everyone for joining puja why, nice why, why not everybody switch on their video take a photo and tweet it Perfect. There's a yes. question that Geetan Jali had asked, right? Public outreach. So yes. <laughs> all the class members to kindly switch on their video so that we can have a group photograph. And Geetan Jali, you tweet it and make sure that everybody who matters is tagged into that photo. Tweet, I will Facebook, make sure. Tweet, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, do everything. Everywhere, everywhere. You know me, Shaker. It'll go everywhere. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Great, great, great. few more videos so request everyone to kindly switch on and give us smile so i'll take few scenes short how long do we keep smiling <laughs> somebody has to say cheese yeah so i took some so say cheese